Good morning. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. Uh, and welcome to the meeting of the subcommittee on uh, zoning and franchises. I'm council member uh, Francisco Moya, the chairperson of uh, the subcommittee. Uh, and we are joined today by council members uh, Levin, uh, Richards, uh, and Grudenchek. Uh, if you are here to um, testify on projects that are on our calendar for which uh, the hearing was not already closed, uh, please fill out a white uh, speaker slip with the sergeant at arms uh, in the back and indicate uh, the name uh, or your LU number of the application you wish to testify uh, on the slip. Uh, we will now start our hearings. Uh, our first hearing is on LU-262, an application pursuant to Section 20-226 uh, uh, of the Administrative Code by 931 Manhattan Cafe LLC, uh, DBA uh, Citron, for a new uh, re revocable consent to maintain, operate, and use an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 931 Manhattan Avenue in Council Member Levin's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I now open the public hearing uh, on this application, and uh, I want to uh, turn it over to Council Member uh, Levin uh, for uh, some remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we appreciate uh, uh, your working with the applicant and my office, as well as land use staff, um, Julie Lubin and Amy Levitan. Uh, to make uh, a compromise possible on this application. Uh, and I will read um, uh, this into the record. This is from the applicant 931 Manhattan Cafe LLC at 931 Manhattan Avenue. Um, this is an application for a sidewalk cafe. Um, and the letter reads, Dear Honorable Chairperson Salamanca, Councilmember Levin, and members of the Council, please accept this letter as confirmation of our agreement with Councilmember Levin. There shall be no more than three tables and six chairs, and all such tables and chairs shall be arranged parallel to and flush against the building. No table, table or chair shall be placed more than 24 inches from measured perpendicular to the building wall. No more than two tables and four chairs may be placed on the south side of the restaurant door and no such table or chair shall occupy more than 18 inches measured along the building wall. No more than one table and two chairs may be placed on the north side of the restaurant door. And no such table shall exceed 24 inches measured along the building wall. If anything else is required, please contact our representative. And that's signed by uh, Craig Captain, member of uh, 931 Manhattan Cafe LLC. We think this is a appropriate uh, Compromise. The application was for five tables and ten chairs um, that would have jutted, jutted out further into um, a very busy pedestrian walkway along the sidewalk on Manhattan Avenue. And um, this will allow uh, the business to have some um, uh, outdoor seating, uh, particularly you know, during um, uh, warmer weather, uh, but uh, we believe won't impede pedestrian traffic. And so we find it to be a appropriate compromise, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. We've also been joined by Council Member uh, Rivera. Uh, are there any uh, um, members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this issue? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, our next hearing is on LU-260, an application uh, pursuant to Section uh, 20-226 of the Administrative Code um, from By the Glass, Inc. for uh, renewal of a, a revocable consent to maintain, operate, and use an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 1486 2nd Avenue in Council Member Kalos' district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this application? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application. Our next hearing is on LU-261, an application pursuant to Section 20-225 of the Administrative Code from the Three Decker Restaurant uh, 
limited for the renewal of a uh, revocable consent to construct and or maintain, operate and use an enclosed sidewalk cafe located at 1746 Second Avenue in Council Member Kalos's district in Manhattan. And I now open up the public hearing on this application. Um, are, there, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this application? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, our next hearing is on LU-263, uh, an application pursuant to Section 20-225 uh, of the Administrative Code from 27 East Restaurant Holdings, LLC, Fleming uh, Le, Bil Le Bouquet, uh, for a revocable consent to construct and or maintain, operate, and use an enclosed sidewalk cafe located at 27 East 62nd Street in Council Member Powers' district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application. Our next public hearing is on LUs uh, 270 and 271, the 1451 Franklin Avenue Seacrest rezoning. Applicant uh, Carmel Partners seeking rezoning of the western side of Franklin Avenue, uh, bounded by the midpoint between President Street and Carroll Street on the north and Montgomery Street on the south and the south train tracks on the west to an uh, R R8X and an R8X C24 district the designation of the mandatory inclusionary housing area, uh, the proposed uh, R8X zoning would permit up to 17 stories and uh, 7.2 FAR and would facilitate the development of approximately 518 apartments of which 378 would be market rate and 140 would be affordable under the MIH option one. The property affected is located in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn uh, and I now open the public hearing on this application. And I would like to call uh, Ray Levin, uh, David Velez, and Matthew uh, Feldman. Uh, I now ask the council to uh, please swear in the panel. Before responding, please state your name into a microphone and make sure the red light is lit. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? I do. And just please state your name. Raymond Levin. I, Matthew Feldman, do. David Velez, I do. We can begin, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Raymond Levin with the firm of Slater and Beckerman, Land Use Council to CP6 Crown Heights LLP, uh, an entity created by Carmel Partners, represented here by Matthew Feldman, Vice President. CP6 Crown Heights LLP is a successor applicant for a zoning map amendment for the area bounded by Montgomery Street to the south, Franklin Avenue to the east, the line midway between Crown and President Streets to the north, and the Franklin Avenue subway cut to the west. CP6 owns vacant property at 46 Crown Street and is the agent for Cornell Realty Management, owner of vacant property at 931 Carroll Street. Um, if you look at the image, uh, the property outlined in red uh, to the north is what's owned by uh, Cornell. The property outlined in red to the south is uh, CP6. Um, the property uh, 
in the middle of this rezoning area is Tivoli Towers, uh, a project that was built in, uh, in the 1970s. Um, the, uh, the two properties are currently zoned R6A, uh, which is a residential zoning district, which allows development of approximately 280 apartments in buildings up to 70 feet in height. Apartments developed pursuant to the as of right R6A regulations would not be subject to any of the city's inclusionary housing, income, leasing, or rent restrictions. Uh, next one, please. Um, the proposed R8X district would allow development of an additional 240 apartments, of which pursuant to the proposed mandatory inclusionary housing area designation, 140 of which would be income targeted. All the apartments, inclusionary and market rate, would be subject to rent stabilization with mandatory lease renewals and rent increases controlled by the Rent Guidelines Board. Um, as you can see on this chart, it outlines uh, the development of the two properties and the, uh, and the number of, uh, of units in each bedroom category that would be uh, uh, developed. Next, uh, Pat. The proposed buildings are located amid 33-story Tivoli just Towers, go, which you can see. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Can you just go back to the, that last slide one certainly. more time? Okay, thank you. I just needed to Oh, okay. Um, next. Um, the proposed buildings uh, are located uh, amid the 33-story Tivoli Towers, which you can see in this image uh, in the upper center. Uh, the proposed buildings uh, are 16 stories, so what's proposed, and they are on either side of Tivoli Towers, um, sort of looking orangey. Um, the 26-story Ebbets Field tower, Towers, which are just to the south in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner of this image. Um, across the street from the proposed project uh, is uh, an undeveloped parking lot that's part of Medgar Evers College. Um, and between uh, the project and the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens uh, are basically six-story uh, apartment buildings, um, I guess post-war apartment buildings. Um, uh, next, we, we've reached out to our neighbors, uh, had meetings with most, have also engaged uh, with the broader Crown Heights uh, community over the last four years, um, making everyone aware of the project. We have uh, letters of uh, support uh, from the Haitian American Council, Tivoli Towers, Tenants Association, Crown Heights Jewish Community Council, uh, Brothers in Growth, and St. Francis of DeSales School for the Deaf on Eastern Parkway. Um, and uh, we can provide those letters to the council. Um, this image just shows the same as the last image except from the other direction, from the, looking at it from the west. You can see Tivoli Towers in the center the two proposed buildings on either side and the uh, six-story apartment buildings uh, between uh, the towers and the gardens. Um, at this point, um, there is a 12-story building being built as of right um, between um, the building on, on Montgomery Street, our building, on, proposed building on Montgomery Street and the gardens uh, on a piece of property that the uh, gardens sold a couple of years ago. Um, the next uh, image, uh, Show, this shows um, the uh, building uh, on the uh, Crown site uh, looking from um, Medgar Evers College with Tivoli Towers uh, on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, next, please. Uh, the, the proposed um, 40 uh, Crown Street building, uh, you can see here this is uh, uh, the lower level has parking. Um, and some uh, retail or community space. Um, first floor uh, has the entrance, entrances, uh, which there are two entrances, one on uh, Montgomery, one on Crown, uh, and space for either uh, retail or community facility. Next, please. Um, on top of the, of the parking, uh, there's uh, open space available to all, all units in the, uh, in the development. 
um, and this just shows how those uh, go up. The site, the site is, is wider than a normal uh, city block, and uh, given the uh, contextual zoning, it pushes the development to the street wall. Um, one of the reasons we asked for the R8X, which has a little more height, is because, because of that, because the center of the site uh, really doesn't accommodate itself to building footprint. Next, please. Um, this is the uh, other site, the Carroll Street site. It's in the middle of the block. Um, parking, parking below, uh, entrances uh, off of uh, uh, Crown Street and uh, apartments above. Uh, there is open space uh, available to all the tenants uh, to the, on the northern part of the site uh, above, the, uh, above the garage. Next, please. Um, and the building just goes straight up. Uh, so the, the, um, the building on, on Crown Street is 390 units, 105 of which would be inclusionary, 190 parking spaces in that garage. Um, and the, uh, on the Carroll Street building, 128 units, 35 inclusionary, uh, 64 parking spaces. Uh, both buildings uh, will be broken down with 5% studios, 40% uh, one bedroom, 35% two bedroom, and 20% three bedrooms. Uh, in summary, uh, the proposed uh, rezoning and MIH designation will allow buildings containing approximately 518 apartments, 140 of which will be income limited. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as shown here, um, you can see the monthly rents depending on the size of the unit and the different AMA categories, AMI categories. So you can, um, you know, see that someone with a, who wants a two bedroom unit who earns 60% of AMI, there are so many units available for that, uh, that family. Um, so it's kind of a, a mix and match is how MIH works. Um, but this is the, the breakdown, and then at the bottom it shows how many units in each category uh, would be part of this project. Um, an environmental review was <coughs> prepared by uh, Philip Habib and Associates, of which uh, Mr. Velez here uh, is, uh, represents. Um, and it was prepared in accordance with the uh, CEQA methodology. Um, and a negative declaration was issued by the Department of City Planning. Uh, stating that no significant, uh, no significant negative effects uh, on the environment were found. Um, thank you very much. Um, Matt can speak a little bit about uh, Carmel uh, and who they are, and then we're certainly here to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Uh, just before we go into that, uh, we just need to go into a quick uh, vote here. So. Okay, I now call for a vote uh, to approve LUs uh, 260, 261, 262, and 263. Uh, the local members are in support. Uh, council, uh, please call the roll. Moya. Aye. Levin. Aye. Reynoso. Aye. Richards. Aye. Rivera. Uh, the land use items are approved by a vote of five in the affirmative, zero negative, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. And will oh, Councilmember Gradenchik. Aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, no negatives, and no abstentions, and we'll leave the vote open. Um, we'll leave the vote open. Thank you, and uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge that we have been joined by um, Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, and now we can proceed with the uh, rest of the testimony. Thank you. Um, in addition to what Ray said, I just want to highlight some additional project benefits that uh, this project can offer to the community in addition to the 140 apartments uh, income targeted at 60% of AMI. Um, in addition, we have uh, met with Impact Brooklyn 
and discuss sponsoring workshops for the community to make sure that applicants can be prepared when the community preference apartments become available and to make sure that people have their required information ready for the lottery and that people um, can get help filling out the applications if required. We also plan on meeting MWBE goals akin as if this was an HPD finance project. Uh, we're also, we'll commit to union staffing post completion if this project is upzoned. Um, and we will also, even though it wasn't on the plans, include a community facility on the project that can be rented to community groups um, either below market or free depending on their needs. Um, in addition, you'll hear from the opposition that has attended prior public hearings. Most of the opposition has been concerned with shadow studies on the botanical gardens. Uh, I just want to say that the botanical gardens issued a letter on October 11th stating this project has no impact and that they have no objections. And with that, I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of questions um, in regards to this uh, in particular. Um, can we just go over um, what the proposed uh, unit size mix again is going to be? Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Let me let me get my. I can't read that from here, so give me a second. Okay, apart you want apartment sizes? Is that yeah? What okay. is the right? What is the, you you gave the breakdown before? If you could yes, just go yeah, over that yeah, again. Yes, yeah. the, the targeted apartment sizes uh, are studios at 400 square feet, one bedrooms at 575 two bedroom at 775 and three bedrooms at 950. Okay. Um, so are, are you, have you uh, had conversations to partner with some local non-for-profit organization uh, to be the administrating uh, agent for the affordable housing? Yes, as I said, we've met with Impact Brooklyn to discuss workshops, and assuming we proceed with uh, the upzoning, we assume that they're going to also be the local administrative agent. Got it. Um, and do you think that it's important for members of uh, the Crown Heights areas to have uh, good jobs? And if so, uh, are there concrete commitments that you're willing to make here regarding that? Yes, as I said, for um, both local hiring and for um, subcontracting, we um, will adhere to the HPD guidelines as if this was an HPD sponsored project. And what is your policy around uh, responsible contracting uh, for building service workers? And if it, you have one, uh, can you make it publicly available to us? So if this project gets up zoned, we will commit to union staffing. And you have been in conversations with? Yes, and we've let, we've let 32BJ know that if this project gets up zone, we will commit. And what are the conversations that uh, you have had with the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens? Um, I know you had mentioned that briefly in your presentation, but regarding the possibility of shadows. So uh, we've reached out to gardens over over the last several years. We haven't had direct conversations with them. Um, they have been a little uh, reticent over time. Uh, they seem mostly concerned with a project that's being proposed to the south of ours. Um, and uh, they issued the letter which we can provide uh, the committee with, uh, indicating that they reviewed our shadow studies uh, that were prepared and uh, and agree with them and uh, and also agree that the shadows cast by the proposed project will not have uh, an impact on the gardens and the plantings within the gardens. 
And one last question is, um, why do you think 17 stories uh, is an appropriate height uh, for this block when the city established a seven-story height limit back in uh, the 1991 rezoning? A lot of things have changed since 1991. Uh, MIH came in, which, uh, which uh, the city uh, is supporting the development of affordable housing as in, in, uh, in as part of uh, market rate housing. Um, so that's one element that leads to um, uh, higher height um, because we intend to participate in that program. Um, the buildings that we're proposing, by the way, are whilst we could build 17 under the zoning, we're only proposing 16. Part of that has to do with, as I explained, the, the site configurations and the implications of of the contextual zone which pushes development out to the edges of the property. Um, next to us is a 33-story is a building. Um, a block away are uh, Ebbets Field houses, which are 25 stories. Um, next to us, on the other side of the cut, closer to the gardens, uh, that 1991 rezoning uh, allowed 12-story buildings closer to the gardens. So it's hard to understand that uh, allowing 12 stories across the street from the gardens and seven stories a block away um, was done because of the gardens. Uh, what was done in 1991 was they took the existing zoning districts and made them all contextual, basically taking an R8 and making an R8A, taking an R6, making an R6A. So that was the major impetus uh, for the zoning, is, although it, it, they do mention the gardens as well. But as I said, 12 stories, is, is uh, uh, permitted closer to the garden, and these are further away. So be the combination of existing development, site conditions, MIH, uh, what led us to request this uh, R8X zone. Thank you. Uh, I now want to turn it over to um, Majority Leader Cumbo for uh, some questions. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, I thank you all for being here today. This particular proposal has attracted significant concerns from the Crown Heights community, um, as well as the elected officials who are feeling the pressure of development. Every year, every month, every week, more and more new developments are coming in with market rate apartments far above what our community can afford to pay. And we wanted to have this particular hearing to gain a greater understanding of this proposal as there have been many changes and many shifts um, since this original proposal was introduced um, and certified. So I want to ask some key quick questions in terms of that are just number questions and then I want to dive deeper. Um, Chair Moya asked a few of these. Um, but I just want it to be on the record. So without this proposed rezoning, what would the size of the development be? So if this doesn't happen, what would the size of the development be at this time? Oh, excuse me. If, uh, if this doesn't happen, uh, we would be, as of right, would allow us to build 70, 70, seven stories, I guess, seven story buildings. Uh, and that those seven story buildings could accommodate approximately 280 apartments, uh, which would, uh, which could be uh, condominiums without any rent renewal or any other sort of governmental controls. Could be or would be condominiums? You have to turn that over to. <laughs> right, I mean, it could be. I don't, I, based on market conditions at the time we start development and financing available, the determination will be made um, what makes the most economic sense at that time. We prefer that the upzone is approved to uh, require the mandatory inclusionary housing so we can develop 140 units for the community. What is the market rate for what we would call market rate slash luxury condominiums in this particular community? What would be the going rate for one bedroom luxury condominium in Crown Heights? As I understand the Crown Heights market right now, the condominium, uh, condominiums would sell for approximately $1,200 a square foot. Do the math for me. It's 
It's, it's just short of 900,000 for a one bedroom. How much? Just short of 900,000 for a one bedroom. 900,000 yeah. for a one bedroom. Short of that, yeah. Short of that. Yeah. So you would be building approximately 280 apartments, which on average, let's see, 36, would be bringing in approximately 900 people, three people in an apartment. Some will be studios, some will be three bedrooms too, just a guesstimate. So 900 people would be coming in that would be purchasing on average, on the low end, a $900,000 condominium. It or could, one bedroom. It could, right. I mean, that, that's the way this could go, yes. What impact do you think that that will have on the Crown Heights community? I mean, to a point, I, I, we understand your concern, Majority Leader. This is not what a is direction that we want. Gentrification is an issue throughout the city. Mm -hmm. um, and we, it's our goal to develop this project under mandatory inclusionary to make sure that there's apartments affordable at every income level, both income targeted for 40 AMI, 60 AMI, 100 AMI, and of course, the market rate units that are subsidizing these income targeted units. However, um, if the upzone does not happen, we have to develop this project as its best economic use, which at this time could be condos, even if that has a detrimental effect on the character of the neighborhood. I'm gonna put on my Dr. Phil hat for a second. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that you potentially could be building 280 luxury condominiums in a gentrifying community where the character is changing and displacement is happening rapidly. How do you feel about that? As I said, our goal is to develop no, this your under, feelings. I'm telling you my feelings are based on my goal to develop affordable housing. Mm -hmm. That's our preference. Um, a former mentor of mine used to say that if landlords want to get rid of rent stabilization, they should build, 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 get the vacancy over 5% so it sunsets all by itself and they'll automatically drive pricing down. That's the reality. The more housing we build, the more we can save communities, and that's part of what the mandatory inclusionary was allowing for. Have you seen that anywhere in New York City actually happen? No. It, there's still income constraints. I mean, there's still vacancy constraints at this time. Okay, let me just go on with the math and I'll get back to your feelings afterwards. Um, now with the proposed rezoning, how many units, how many affordable units, and how many stories? Now I know you answered that question, but I just want it on the record. So with the proposed rezoning, how many units? Total? Yep. Total units, uh, approximately 518. 518, how many affordable? 140. And that would bring the building to how many stories? The buildings as proposed are 16 stories. 16 stories. How many, okay, so we can do the math there. Would all of these units be permanently affordable or would they expire at some point? A mandatory inclusionary housing is permanent. How do you define permanent? Under the zoning, I mean, as uh, you're gonna do a, an agreement with HPD, I believe that they, the permanent is permanent. As long as the buildings are standing. Yeah. Permanent has different definitions, just like affordable. We'll come back to that. What is the proposed unit, the, the bedroom mix? You spoke about that for Council Member Moya, but if you could just do it for me again, that'd be appreciated. Sure. Uh, the bedroom mix, uh, the currently proposed, studios 5%, one bedroom 40%, two bedroom 35%, three bedroom 20%. Can you talk to me a bit? One of the things that we have all been in discussion with, and I know that we left off with conversation about this, which I'm very interested in, is where your negotiations are currently with AFI in terms of the ability to include a not-for-profit partner into the project for my purposes to increase the level of affordability, but also to reduce the density. Where are you all with those particular negotiations? Well, um, going back in history, a uh, little over three years ago, um, there was a memorandum of, of understanding uh, that was circulated uh, with uh, AFI, who owns that out parcel, 
Uh, in fact, we met in your office to discuss uh, the contours of that proposal. Um, that at, at a point, um, uh, Afi withdrew from that, from those discussions. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, we've re-engaged them. We, uh, we reached out to them on a number of occasions and finally had a discussion with them uh, within the last several days uh, where they were going to look at how how we might, how, how from their perspective we might come to some agreement. Uh, they were going to get back to us. They haven't as of yet. There are some impediments in the short term because there are restrictions on the AFI site that, uh, deed restrictions that HPD put on that site when they sold it a, a number of years ago. Um, so that... Can you give me an example of what those would be? Like what would prevent them from... Well, they, 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 there was an accelerated UDAP, as we understand it, that was done to sell it to a, uh, actually a predecessor to uh, AFI. Um, and they limit the number of units at the time that that um, sale uh, went forward. Uh, there were buildings on the property and basically at the time they were uh, intent on, on uh, rehabbing those um, for one reason or other, which I'm unaware of. Uh, they were take, the buildings were taken down and the site was transferred from that owner that bought it directly from HPD to, to AFI. Um, uh, I believe that under the current deed restriction, um, something in the area of 16 units could be developed. That's it? Uh, I believe so. Um, we, when going, going back again to the three, three years ago, <clears throat> when we were working with AFI and HPD, um, HPD prepared uh, a draft of a ULERP application to uh, remove those restrictions, and the notion was that they would put different restrictions on, on, uh, on the site that AFI would develop at that time. But right. as I said, that uh, those discussions evaporated. Um, so now, in terms of, of the discussions with them, we are waiting to hear back as to what, what they think. It seemed from the discussion that they were um, concerned about their independence, I guess is how I would say it. Uh, Fair. Um, and that uh, they believe that with the rezoning and with HPD's uh, concurrence, they believe that uh, 50 units could be developed on their, right. on their property under those conditions. Um, and we talked to them about squaring off properties, about additional properties. About, we discussed a, a number of things in a, in a relatively short telephone conversation with them uh, the other day, and they're going to get back to us. So we will see where it goes. And so if the zoning that you're looking for today were to be allowed on AFI's um, site, they would potentially be able to build 100% affordable units, 50, 100% well, yeah, affordable units? Yeah, well, that's, that's their, their, their mission driven, not for profit, right. which they would, they believe We'll, we'll have to see, but they believe that they've had discussions with HPD uh, where HPD would, would fund uh, an affordable housing project. Okay. Let me just say the, the, the partnership with AFI is very important to me. So I would like for you all to continue to invest the time, energy, and resources to understanding what an AFI partnership would actually look like and HPD uh, lifting uh, those restrictions so that we could understand what a partnership would look like from my perspective to increase the affordability but also to decrease the total density of the entire project. That's my goal. You all have your goals. That's my goal. Um, <clears throat> can you talk a bit about the borough president's recommendation? So the borough president recommended that a portion of the commercial space be set aside for local not-for-profit organizations such as arts or cultural organizations at below market lease terms. Have you considered this recommendation? Um, integration of local businesses and not-for-profit organizations into new development is an important priority of mine, but is often overlooked by developers and city agencies. So the community 
has been looking at opportunities for more, and for myself as well, space for not-for-profits, ground floor affordability, also with the um, dynamics that we're seeing with so much of our uh, particularly uh, institutions and businesses of color have closed with much of the development that's happening. Is there an opportunity to have below market rate leases for not-for-profits as well as local businesses in the area? Yes, Majority Leader. As I said in my statement, um, the designs are being further refined for the building from the, uh, the designs we showed here. And at this time, we are including 1,500 square feet on the first floor of community facility that can be given to community groups either at below cost or for free depending on the use and uh, how many groups are sharing the space. In terms of the retail, we believe that um, for the neighborhood character, we would strive to find a local business and to the extent that that doesn't um, affect our ability to get uh, construction or permanent financing for the project, um, we'll be using best efforts to set aside space for that purpose. Set aside space at below or low cost? For local community businesses akin to, um, well, the community facility, yes, below cost or for free. Now let me just say, 1,500 square feet is very small. That's about the size of a standard storefront space. Right. So that would only be like one space. Mm -hmm. So that's not really impactful if right. we're talking about impact. This, again, I mean, all these questions sort of come down to where the zoning falls out. We would want to maximize the space as we can within the constraints of the zoning. So 1,500 potentially for community facility or uh, a not-for-profit organization. And what is the square footage for the retail that would be remaining? The overall square footage of retail is 15,000 square feet on, on, gray, on the ground floor. Now we're talking 15,000 square feet. On the ground floor and in the, uh, and in the basement. So it's split because the, the site has a big slope to it. So have you thought of any, from the conversations that you've had, and I understand that you've had multiple conversations with community leaders in the neighborhood, have you thought about how to program or to curate that 15,000 square feet? Well, I just we, wanted to do one clarification. It's up to 1,500. Right now, the basement is not being fully 15, excavated. 15,000, right. It's not, it, it's 7, I believe it's 7,000 at grade and up to 7,000 below grade um, if the building gets constructed that way. Okay, we've, in, in terms of our discussions uh, with, uh, with community groups, uh, immediate neighbors and others, uh, that issue hasn't come up. The issue has not come up in terms of community needs. In terms of curating the space for specific users, no. Okay, so the next time that we're in this space together, I would like to have a further understanding of how you're going to program that and how it's going to be uh, a representation of the needs of the community. You have Medgar Evers College, a stone throws away. You have over 10,000 families in Ebbets Field. You have Tivoli Towers. You have many different services that need to be fulfilled there. Anything from healthy food options to senior centers, to daycare centers, um, to retail components, to better service, let's say, Medgar Evers College. There's only maybe one or two, and I'm just saying two because I'm not familiar with what the second one might be, but there's only one sit-down restaurant um, in that area. So there's a need for different programs and services um, in the community and would like to know. Everything from pediatricians to uh, different specialties that could be uh, programmed there would certainly like to see that. Um, can you describe for me your plans for local hiring? Um, so for during the construction period, as I said, we'll be following the MWBE guidelines as if this was a similar finance HPD project. Um, I can't speak particularly to how the mechanics of the local hiring, but we will hire a, um, a consultant to work with our uh, general contractor to ensure that the guidelines are followed um, to use best efforts for local hiring. Have you had any experience doing local hiring in New York City? 
as I said, we're gonna hire a consultant. I personally have not hired for construction jobs. It's the, the contractor so no. does that. I personally do not know. Because this is a huge issue, particularly in the Crown Heights community. If you look at Ebbets Field, if you look at Tivoli Towers, unfortunately, there are dozens of young people, predominantly African-American men, who are unemployed in that community. And a project like this has the potential to be able to train, hire, employ, and give the expertise that many of them would need um, in order to work on this job, as well as many others. So to not have a plan at this stage um, is problematic. So I would certainly want to see, moving forward, a plan of action in terms of what local hiring is going to look like, because that is a critical component um, to development in our area, making sure that there is real affordability, making sure that there are real jobs that are happening, that there's training, that there is a pipeline um, to take people out of many of the circumstances of uh, unemployment that many are facing. Um, <clears throat> and as Councilmember Moya talked about, is there a commitment to good jobs and prevailing wage for future property uh, service and maintenance workers after the project is completed? Yes, um, if the rezoning is approved, that we will commit to union labor for post uh, for project staffing post completion. Okay, and you're willing to put that in writing? Absolutely. As part of a contract? Yes. Okay. Um, the other aspect that, um, if you could talk to me a bit about the transition from Cornell Realty to your company, uh, Carmel, as well as the interests that the previous developer maintains in this project? I'm not sure exactly what your question is. We purchased the site from Cornell, who had started this process. Um, it was an arm's length at market purchase. And what was that purchase price? Um, I don't recall off the top of my head. <laughs> I wasn't involved in the purchase. That's very problematic. Well. While we're still here at the hearing, text someone and find out that information because there's got to be somebody that has that information. And we'll wait. So but there's. In, but two. in the interim, in the interim also, I am also very interested because it hasn't been made clear to me um, the interest that the previous developer still maintains in this project because I haven't been able to figure out, but somehow you all are still connected through all of this. Well, as you know, there's two sites covered by this rezoning. The prior yep. owner still controls the smaller site to the north. So how do they plan to benefit if this rezoning happens? How do they benefit or do not benefit if this rezoning does or does not happen? Well, their site... Yeah. Well, their, their site would be rezoned, and they would, uh, they would be subject to MIH, um, and they could build um, uh, 93 market rate units and 35, 35 units would be um, uh, uh, inclusionary, totaling 128. That's what they could build if this rezoning were to be approved. And would you have an interest or a stake in their development? No. We own our site, they own their site. Okay. And... And if the development does not happen, how does that, if, excuse me, if the rezoning does not happen, how does that impact Cornell? Uh, hold on one second. I will, uh, no problem. Shoot out an answer. And I hope we're looking for the other answer. I hope someone's texting okay. someone no, feverishly. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so let's see. The, the other site without the rezoning. Uh, 69, 69 apartments. Okay. Okay. Um, and to my other question. Sure. So um, the purchase price for the as of right for the larger site was $40.5 million. 
Um, if the uh, sites get rezoned up to the R7X, the purchase price for the large site becomes $64 million. How much? I'm, I'm sorry, Matt, but you, for the audience, please, we just need everyone to. So $64 million if the rezoning does happen. Correct. Okay. okay, those are all the questions that I have. I think I've been very clear in terms of what my um, interests are, what I want to see. I'll just reiterate as well. Um, definitely want to continue to see how the partnership with AFI unfolds. Want to understand what your real local hiring plan is going to be and how it will be executed and what partners you plan to utilize for that. Would like to understand and have a better uh, in writing understanding of how uh, hiring will happen um, post the completion of the project and how you will work with uh, our unionized workforce in order to make that happen. Uh, want to have a real understanding of how the AFI partnership will increase um, affordability and to reduce uh, the height of the buildings and want to have a real understanding of how the commercial and uh, retail space will be utilized for not-for-profits as well as local businesses in the area in a way that is both affordable as well as permanent um, as it relates to the entire project. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. We look forward to talking with you this, about this. And we'd like heat next time we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you, you awake much. and alert. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I want to call up the next panel. Uh, Dale Ferdinand, Sam Pierre, and Ellie Cohen. Excuse me, before the previous panel leaves, if you all could leave a representative to hear at least the first two panels, uh, that would be effective so that you could take this information back. Okay. Just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you have two minutes, and uh, we're going to start um, on this side. Are you, your name? You have to push the button to. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Sam Pierre. Great. Thank you, Sam. You may begin. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, council members and community. I'm very excited to be here. Um, my name is Sam Pierre. I'm the executive director of the Haitian American Caucus, also the uh, chairman of the Haitian American Supplier Diversity Task Force. Um, and I just want to be very brief about the, the, the points that we have on this project. Uh, we are actually in support of this project. This is the first time that the Haitian community has actually been brought to the table uh, with a developer on a opportunity to do an affordable um, housing uh, project in addition to uh, um, helping with the management of the community space that will be developed. Um, yes, we do understand that there's um, a large opposition against this project. However, we have yet to um, hear what are the recommendations or the solutions uh, to the from the opposition. Uh, we have sat with the table. We have sat at the table with the developers and um, and understand that this is an opportunity to bring 140 affordable housing units to our community. Um, you know, we've gone back and forth and we said, okay, we always have fights, we have conversations about bringing affordable housing, but there's no other solutions. Um, I, we've, I've spoken to, and our organization has spoken to so many different community partners and everyone has told us that, yes, they have concerns and we should have concerns and we need to keep the developers feet to the fire. However, this is an opportunity to bring affordable housing to our community. Um, the Haitian community has lived in Crown Heights for a very long time. Many of them cannot come back after the students graduate, go away from school to school. They can't come back because they can't afford it. Um, having affordable housing and market rate housing would be a great way for members of the Haitian community to come back and live in Crown Heights. Um, the last point I also want to make is that 
um, the, the Haitian Supply Diversity Task Force is going to be sitting with them, um, is going to be sitting with the developers so that we can hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they actually do what they say. Many a times the opposition, we say we don't want it, but we never sit with the developers through the lifeline of the project. We're committed to doing that, and I, I understand I might be demonized by the community, but I'm not afraid, we're going to fight, we're holding um, strong, and we want to make sure that our community has access to 140 affordable housing units. Thank you. Thank you. Dale? Yep. Just state your name and you may begin. My name is Dale Ferdinand. Oh, sorry. My name is Del Ferdinand. I am a small business owner and also a member of the Haitian American Suppliers Diversity Task Force. And um, I'll be real brief. I'm actually here today as a proud Haitian American, um, a proud lifelong resident of Crown Heights, and also a proud servant of the needs of my community. Um, I know firsthand, um, living in Crown Heights, that rent has gone up dramatically where a lot of my peers were forced to like move down south because you know they could simply afford it. I was actually in a situation um, where I was unable and I had to make a decision whether to pay my rent or to buy groceries to feed my daughter. So I'm a strong believer that if anyone doesn't understand the needs of our community, they, there's no reason for them to be there. And I felt as a community, being from Crown Heights, that we refuse to have our needs ignored. Uh, we refuse to have our concerns thrown on the back burner. And we also refuse to not have a seat at the table. And taking all of this into consideration, um, actually speaking with the developers, this is why I and the members of my community also agree that this, um, rezoning proposal should be approved. I do also know that uh, this committee and the city council has also made a lifetime worth of good decisions and choosing to approve this rezoning proposal will be yet another good decision that they can add to list of good decisions that they make. And with that, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Good morning, council members, especially our own uh, council member combo who's here. Um, I'm Rabbi Eli Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Crown Heights Jewish Community Council. And we're also coming to speak in favor of the project. And uh, I'm assuming this goes for all of the projects that are under consideration under this, um, the, this rezoning. So um, the, the, the real benefit that we see to the community is that housing. You, we speak to everybody, all, all our clients, if they're African American, Caribbean American, Jewish American, Whatever, whoever, the primary concern that everybody has is the scarcity of housing. And anything that can replenish the housing stock and bring more housing to, to, to the fore is to be appreciated. Of course, most of our community residents are not able to afford the market rate housing, but having the inclusionary housing being part of the mix and at pretty decent affordability rates, they're not great, but some of the younger people who are going into the professions who are able to afford these, and we do see in some of the other projects that have been built recently uh, on Franklin Avenue, on uh, the one that's being built on Bedford, we ha and also uh, in the southeast quadrant, sort of towards uh, Council Member Samuel's district, there's been some uh, building over there. And our clients of all different races and, and, and creeds are finding housing. So it's not hundreds of people, but it's, a smatter, uh, it's taking the pressure off. There, the de there I is stuff out there for people to look for and find, and I think that's the biggest benefit. Um, we certainly support uh, the council members' uh, attempts to get the maximum benefit to the community that we can, and I think that's good. It's not, we're not, uh, I, obviously, the developer stands to benefit, and some of that benefit, it would be great if it can be shared with the community and the av availability of other uh, amenities like community space, et cetera, I think is also a positive thing. So all over, I think we, ha oh, I just wanna say one more thing and that is to some of the negative that's been said about uh, the height and the density and so on. I live right across the street from Carroll Gardens, which is a very similar building to Tivoli Towers. It's the best neighbors you could have. It's calm, it's quiet, it has parking. 
it's, it really gives the ability to, for us to enjoy our, uh, a standard of living which is better than the neighborhood around. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question for both the, all three of you. Um, Mr. Pierre, if you could, <clears throat> in terms of your question, could you explain to me more clearly in terms of what your relationship or your organization's relationship will be with this development project um, with more clarity? And then for all three of you, what is in this, what is not in this project that you would like to see moving forward? What is an element of this project that would improve this project or would make it more um, appropriate for the community? I'll start with you, Mr. Pierre. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, so we are, um, and we are in communication serving as their um, ha housing advocacy um, group so that we can um, consolidate mo a lot of the different um, housing nonprofit organizations that are looking for affordable housing opportunities for their clients, uh, for their constituents. So we are in communications with different housing organizations all over Brooklyn and bring them to the table because one of the biggest issues that they have is that they, if, if their clients are looking for affordable housing, if they don't have projects where they're in partnership, right, with the developers, then they don't have a list to even offer their clients. So we're trying to create a, a relationship where, okay, there's 140 potential um, affordable housing units that are gonna be available. We have organizations such as NHS who have hundreds of clients who are looking for affordable housing. How do we bring them to the table and say, okay, here's a project that's available for you to apply for. We understand that there's no preference, right? It's a lottery, we understand that, but we're bringing an opportunity to the table, which is what we should be doing. How will you work with Medgar Evers College to achieve those goals? We'd love to work with Medgar Evers College. We've already had a few conversations with Medgar Evers College. Um, and we will see what their needs are as well, because I'm sure Medgar Evers College and their students, um, they have lists of folks who are looking for affordable housing. So serving as the housing advocate, we would definitely bring everyone to the table and show them how that they can apply for this and show them that there's a real opportunity. We have people who come to us and say that affordable housing is an issue and there's no affordable housing opportunity. We want to be able to, to give them that opportunity. Thank you. And something that's not in this project that you would like to see that would make it more applicable to the community would be what? Um, something I'd like to see is like a tech center. I, we all understand that technology is a new wave. Um, and having like a tech center there for the community so they can learn about coding, they can learn about STEM, they can learn about different things like that, would I think would be great because um, now the community can benefit and learn a skill that they can actually use right away. So that's one of uh, the key things that the Supply Diversity Task Force is doing, the MWBE piece, right? We, we are going to be um, working directly with the developer to ensure that on our task force, we have MWBE consultants that will ensure that all of the suppliers that are on there, right, that they've gone through the MWBE check. So this is an, an opportunity for us to be able to, to work on a real project and get real results. Thank you. Yes. As to um, something I would like to see included in this project in particular, um, well, speaking for you know the members of my community, um, it's really two things. The first thing is uh, kind of just just making sure that the affordable housing units are actually affordable, because um, speaking from experience uh, as many members of my community as well, like rent is like a very, very big burden. So just, and the developers are um, actively working to make sure that these units are actually affordable. So that, that's the first part. The second part would kind of be to um, also to see that there are actual programs that allow the members of the community to, to enhance their skill set. So they can go out potentially and uh, gang employment or you know create new opportunities for themselves. So the first part will definitely be make sure that the affordable housing is actually affordable for the members of the community. And then the second thing is to implement programs that sharpen the skill set of the members of the community. Thank you, thank you. So 
to answer the question, I think that the first part is that the fact that there was outreach done by the developers, which we didn't see in other projects, to come and meet and find community partners, I think is encouraging. I think um, if there is some kind of mechanism that could you know, sort of enforce that kind of relationship, or at least to, to memorialize it as something that we can refer back to in the future that could be useful. Um, I think your uh, ideas of about, and, and to specifically focused on the local groups. I, you know, we have housing projects that we, ha that we have currently uh, from an earlier period, and we have a beautiful mix of different races and nationalities living in that housing, and it's, and it's really a very positive thing that I think it can be a model of living together, so that's something that we would want to propagate and, and, and work on. Um, and to that end, I think, we, I don't know if it was mentioned here, but the idea of a community set aside for Board 9, if that's possible to do that, I'm, I know there's some legal question about it, but a, a, a community set aside would be something we would like to see, plus some of the things you spoke about uh, in your questioning t about uh, community availability of community space and uh, other facilities and amenities that could be brought into the mix. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader, and thank you uh, all for your testimony. I'm going to be calling uh, the next panel, but before I do, I just want to recognize that we have um, Chair uh, Salamanca, uh, who has joined us uh, today as well. Uh, Alicia Boyd, David Cohen, and uh, Sakia Fletcher. And, and we can start with uh, Sakia. Hello, good morning. My name is Sakia Fletcher. I'm currently a student at Megaravis College. Oh, Move the mic closer. Down. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, um, good morning. I'm my name is Sakia Fletcher. I'm currently a student at Megaravis College. I'm a public administration student, and I'm here today in opposition of this project and I'm also the president of the Public Administration Club, and I stand with my members that we are also in uh, strong opposition of this project. So um, just to speak about the project, um, we actually, so as you can see from, from right here, our college is this location that's adjacent to it in the front. Um, just the impact, so the developer spoke about impact and they gave a lot of numbers, but I wanna speak on the per perspective of the students and the children and the, the park and the schools that are in the neighborhood and mostly the emotional, mental, and um, impact of the people within the community, especially um, the community that represents largely single mothers and I also represent a single mother household. Um, 140, uh, well, 140 uh, affordable housing as the developer has proposed is bar minimum to what is needed. Um, we had the borough president came to our college and actually broke down the current laws that are going on. So right now under the current laws, the developer gets to pick who he wants to um, be in the, um, the development. Um, for my own self, I've been rejected for over 11 applications. Um, there's a lot of discrimination going on and particularly if you're a woman of color, um, even more if you're a woman of color with children. Um, so they get that preference of who they want to come into the building, even if you have um, the income, even if you may meet or income levels. So, and also, um. just to talk about the emotional and just the effect of projects, when you see projects like this coming into an area it's very disheartening because it, it shows you that they're b basically pushing you out of your area um, and just really just telling you blatantly in your face that this area is not for you. Um, when you go and fill out the applications, when you talk to them, they're very um, rude. And this is, the project is way too big, it's way too tall. You have a playground that's right in front of it that is going to really impact the children that is playing in that playground and the, also a charter school that's right in front of it. And as a student, um, the 
effect that it has on the Franklin Avenue station. So the station already is very, is packed. It's um, people, new people, influx of um, people uh, that has to use that particular station. Um, this station will primarily probably be the only station that is used because it's right down the block. It just has a, a very uh, impact with the influx of people and it's um, definitely opposed to this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd. I'm a resident, longtime Brooklyn Knight. I represent the movement to protect the people and flat flower lovers against corruption. I have presented to you um, a document from the state senator's office. Do you have that in front of you? This document was written and sent to Laurie Cumbo and a whole set of other uh, elected officials. It's concerning the fact that we have been documenting through the, out, the entire process that the Cornell Realty application has violated the state environmental quality review laws. They are laws, uh, council people, and as a city council agency, you are obligated to adhere to the state laws. And these state laws are very specific about environmental consequences. So his Senator Parker, this development is in Senator Parker's jurisdiction, so his letter should hold some weight in when it comes to any decisions that the council is going to make. But I will just read some of the paragraphs for the audience. Um, Cornell Realty Environmental Assessment Statement that is required by the New York State Law, CICRA. There appears to be gross errors and a series of misrepresentation of the facts in the statement. This in turn has prevented the application from being subject to an environmental impact analysis to determine the negative environmental consequences to the community, the garden, our water, and sewage facilities. On the second page, fourth paragraph, pursuant to section 691CRR 617.7, and eight, state environmental quality review, a lead agency must check to ensure a proper analysis is done to determine if an environmental impact statement must be conducted in the New York City Department of City Planning is the lead agency. Thus, he requested that Cornell Realty's application be reviewed for accuracy to determine if the EAS had been um, conducted appropriately and that he be kept informed and also that the Department of City Planning was supposed to then provide a description of the rationale and the quantitative data that informed the agency's determination. None of this was done. The, the main issue, yes, the main the issue up. is that on Cornell Realty's application, there is a section in the environmental assessment statement which acts as very clearly do you, is your development going to make more than 400 residential units? Cornell Realty said no. As a result of that, and that's on the second, that's we, on we the second to, one. We have to keep it to two okay. minutes. Okay. okay so After, just what wrap it up. they did is they stated no. And as a result of them stating no, they did not do an environmental assessment statement on the water and sewage. Okay. This is a direct violation. Thank you. Uh, additionally, Thank you. Additionally, we, we, we have we have other uh, people here to testify. I understand that, but you gave a lot of other people uh, a lot more time past uh, the two minutes. Actually, I, I've been giving everyone the same amount of time, and I've extended it. Also, to you, the shadow study. I would like to make one more statement about the shadow study. The shadow study that they had performed did not include the bulkhead. Thank this you. is a violation of the secret laws. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Um. Good morning, chairs, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, Councilmember Barron. My name is David Cohen. I represent 32BJ SEIU. Uh, 32BJ represents over 80,000 people who clean and maintain buildings throughout the city. I'm going to speak about good permanent jobs. Um, we're here to express our concerns about this rezoning. Uh, CPVI Crown Heights LLC, an affiliate of Carmel Partners and the lead on the ULERP, has failed to give sufficient assur assurances that building service jobs at this site 
will come with job protections, prevailing wages, and other responsible employment practices like job training and safety standards. Recent experience at another project owned by Carmel Affiliate gives us great pause at 19 Dutch, a rental project uh, owned by that affiliate. Uh, con a, the contractor at the building committed to paying prevailing wage was terminated, and most of the existing uh, workers lost their job. We find this alarming, particularly given that building service jobs are typically filled by local residents, and we're concerned about what that means for the project before it hooks today. The rezoning is not just about the building that the developer has proposed. It would change three blocks in Crown Heights and has the potential to expand the footprint of other property owners um, who have been accused of mistreating tenants and violating rights. These concerns extend to Carmel Partners itself, an affiliate of which reportedly has history of evicting students and families in California from affordable housing in order to build luxury condos. 40 seconds, okay. We believe that these are compelling reasons to keep the zoning in this area as it is, rather than allowing landlords and developers with questionable track records to expand. It's also worth noting that if this rezoning is not approved, new residential construction that happens as of right may use the 421A tax credit. If this occurs, affordable housing could be created without MIH and without a rezoning um, that would add additional market rate units to the neighborhood. We know there's a lot of development happening in Crown Heights, and we believe that any project that is being proposed should deliver serious benefits. We have about, in and around the project, we have about a thousand of our members live there. Um, so I can, you can, you can, you can I'll just sum up. up. So additionally, we think that developers seeking to change the neighborhood should make a meaningful effort to address community concerns. Um, this application is substantially similar to a previous one withdrawn in 2017. Um, and once again, the rezoning was unanimously rejected by the community board, disapproved by the borough president, and we believe it sets a problematic precedent uh, for development in Crown Heights without those um, strong good job commitments. We urge you to vote against it. Thank you. I just want to say I'm very impressed that you are here today representing Medgar Evers College and speaking on behalf of the student body and <clears throat> as you stated also as a single mom. Just wanted to ask you, just from the testimony that you heard today, what are your thoughts in terms of the opportunity, the opportunities, if you would call them that, of building either a seven-story building with 280 luxury apartments that will be going, let's say for an average of a million dollars each, or the ability to create 518 units with 140 of those units being affordable. The options are with this particular development project, which are so difficult, is that something will be built there regardless. Um, once, as it was stated, someone spends $40 million on property, they want to see something realized there. So what are your thoughts in terms of either a luxury building of 280 units with no affordability or the option to have 140 units? Because this is what is my everyday challenge. So and I'd like to propose the same question to you, Mrs. Boyd, as well. Um, absent of the technicalities that are very real around the, um, the ULERT process and how things were um, adhered to or not. But I would like to start with the young lady first. So, in particular, those two options are actually not even good options. Either way, when you say affordable, as you said, that word has been hijacked and is no longer affordable. Our incomes are in that particular area and in boroughs such as the Bronx and other areas. We've been mixed in with Nassau County and um, people who make more high income. So, Correct. Um, the, even the affordable, as we call it affordable, is still not a feasible option. Um, especially when the developers have all of the they have all of the chips and all of the marbles because they have the the um, option of saying uh, setting the ami they also have the option of saying who applications are approved um, um, when you go in and even if your application is approved based on income which they base it on income um, when you go in for the interview they have the option of saying whether um, they want to move forward with your application a lot uh, or not let me ask you this question because you also stated that you had been rejected 11 times. Have you made it to the interview process? Yes, I have, four How times. How many times? Four times. Four times. And what happens at that interview process? Are you explained as to why 
you were not able to move forward? Because we do hear this particular issue come up quite frequently. So um, the first time when I was rejected, I made it to the process of um, being able to actually have a sit down interview. And they told me, you know what, this um, project is not for you. Um, the preference actually is not set for you. So they also have the option of saying which preference, well, your um, zip code doesn't fall within the preference. So you meet the income level, but because of, you eat, meet the income level, but because of the preference, you don't fall but, but within the preference that they set for that particular project. So that was one of them. Another one, they didn't give me a, de a definite why I don't meet it. The only thing that they said, we're gonna further review your application. And based on, I think they only set, it may be either 100, so say, let's use this project for example. If they say 140, you have one bedroom. I'm a single mother, I live by myself, head of, head of household. Um, in, in my category, it might be only four. Four for a person that meets single, um, one person, head of a uh, child, it might only be four actual apartments for my particular, because then you narrow down also. So if those four apartments are gone, then you don't, even though you meet the income level, your four is, you're out, does it, we, you don't meet any other. So that's the way they set it down. They cut it even more based on um, also um, your component, who, who's in your household, how many people are in your household. So it's not only income, but household composition also. So just in closing, both options on the table. Mm -hmm. Both are horrible options. Yes. Which option do you choose? I definitely don't choose it to raise it to 17 feet, the option that, that's definitely not. So um, you, you choose the luxury condominiums? Um, I don't choose either option, but if that was on the table, if that, so if this so a feasible, um, if that was on the table, as you stated, there is gonna be something on the table that we go back into the, the negotiation, in particular with Mega Rivers College, seeing that if they wanted to put another application instead of those condominiums, maybe adding a component that would even be a higher benefit unto to the people that was, that's in the community. I hear you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Boyd. First and foremost, that area is rezoned to protect the garden. And the shadow studies that were produced by the city in 1991 stated that anything past 13 stories would be detrimental to the garden. So now we're proposing 17 stories because we want a few affordable housing, which is never affordable to us when we look at the AMI of $104,000, where our AMI is $40,000. So we know the affordable category does not apply to us. It actually applies to a community that will come into the community. So I don't buy the affordable. And I do not think that we need to be endangering our public green spaces for a few crumbs of affordable housing. If the developer wanted to build affordable housing, there are lots of pieces of land all over Brooklyn that they could buy, have affordable housing, and not impede upon our green spaces. But they don't do it because they want affordable housing. They do it because they want park views. And that's why they're doing it. And we all know that. This is about park views and getting as much money as they possibly can because of those park views. So no, I do not take the option. And like my colleague said, they'll be looking for the 421A tax break. You can bet your bottom dollar on that one. They'll be putting aside some affordable units so they can get some money from that. And so, no. In 1991, the city said, we're going to protect the garden. We're going to put height limits in this community because there are three major places that could be developed. The land, the sky, the sun has not moved. We still have the same ecosystems. We still have the same impacts. We have produced documents that show that Cornell Realty lied on their EAS, that they failed to apply to the state and city regulations, and yet everybody that we have went in front of refuses to pay attention to that, just like you will not pay attention to that. What you will say 
when you approve this plan, because we know this is what you will do, you will say that 135 affordable units is great for our community, and we just need to have that because we have an affordable housing crisis, completely ignoring the fact that it will have a detrimental effect on our public green spaces and also have a detrimental effect on our community because we will wind up with 500 units that are not affordable to our community and we'll have about 16 apartments that somebody in our community will be able to purchase. Cornell Realty brought that piece of property with the six or seven story height limited zone. They knew what they were getting into. Let them build as of right. Thank you very much, Mrs. Boyd. We are gonna call up the next panel. Um, oh. Councilmember Barron has questions. We'd like to recognize Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you very much. Just briefly, you represent, you're representing the student body at Medgar. Uh, okay, are you a part of the student government there or just a student there interested in this project? Yes, yeah, so I'm the president of the Public Administration Club. Oh, great. So I also sit on the um, SGA as um, the representative or the leadership of my department. Good. I'm glad to hear that because I am the chair of the Committee on Higher Education and I'm always pleased to see that students are involved and in raising their voices. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. And in terms of, uh, Ms. Boyd, your position of inaccuracies in the application, the application then said that they would not go beyond a designated number of apartments and now the project is beyond what they had yes, said they would do? I, I can show it to you. If you look at page, this is the second document that I produced okay, here. Okay, the clerk will give it to me. I and on page talking. seven of that document, did the clerk give it to you? Um, I'll, he'll give it okay, to me afterwards. On the, underneath the water and sewage infrastructure, it asks, does this project produce more than 400 residential units? And they checked no. As a result of them checking the no, they did not have to take a look at the water and sewage analysis that's required by the city and the state. Okay. So that means is that we will have 565 residential units that will be putting strain on our water and sewage systems, which are out of compliance as it is with the federal government and not having the developer okay. take a look at that and talk about how they can mitigate that. Okay, and finally, I'm very concerned about density all across the city. And we had a project in my district that I don't remember the proposed number of stories, but it was across the street from a garden. And the city at that time tried to say the garden was not protected but as God would have it, we had someone do some research and find documents that attested to the fact that the city had at some point conducted that property as a garden. So we were able to get the garden protected and preserved because the city was not going to keep it. And a part of that requirement was that they had to do the shadow analysis for the entire year and show what the impact was on that particular garden and we, based on that information, we did have them reduce the height, and we did have them enter in an agreement with the gardens that would give them benefits for the duration of the time that they're there. So I'm very much concerned about gardens and protecting them and not losing open space, and we look forward to further investigation to find out well, if, well, in fact, there was some misrepresentation or change from the document that was initially subject, uh, submitted, and if there's change, then they need to comply with the re requirements of the change. Well, what we did is we conducted two independent studies that we have given to, uh, the, to um, this EULA application, and both of our studies showed that the potential impact on the garden would be negative based upon Cornell Wheels application. So we have provided that documentation. It is a part of the EULA process records. And so we will move forward with challenging anything that the city council does because we're basically saying that we have proof that this development will have a detrimental effect. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the uh, next and last panel, uh, Jeffrey Davis, uh, Demetrius uh, Hawkins, and Jennifer Sun. I just want to say, or to add to the record, just so that those that are watching or viewing at home, the proposed units for the affordability, the permanent units, would be approximately 52 units at 40 AMI. So 52 units, quote unquote, affordable at 40 AMI for a family of four would be a combined household income of 41,720. So there would be 52 units set aside for a family of four making $41,720 a year. There would be 26 units at 60 AMI, and that would be for a family of four, $62,580. And there would be 52 units at 80 AMI, which would be $83,440. So right now, minimum wage is $31,200 a year. So one person making, uh, working at let's say a fast food industry, a restaurant, a McDonald's or a Wendy's in the nearby area, making $31,200 would qualify. Uh, a couple together, both making minimum wage would qualify at the 60 AMI. And potentially for the 80 AMI, that would be maybe an early child care worker um, and a partner potentially at the 83,440 area. So that's what's being proposed here. So I just want people to understand um, what the quote unquote affordability is. Again, for a family of four, we're looking at 52 units at $41,720 for a family of four, 26 units for a family of four at 62,580 and 52 units um, at 80 MI for a combined household family of four at 83,440. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jennifer. Good morning, Chair, Councilmember Cumbo, and Councilmember Barron. Thanks for the opportunity to submit to testimony. I'll read an abbreviated version, um, but you do have a fuller version of our testimony there. So my name is Jennifer Sun, and I'm the co-executive director of Asian Americans for Equality, AFI. Um, I apologize that the other co-executive director, Thomas Yu, could not be here. He actually leads our affordable housing development work at AFI. We are an established 45-year-old nonprofit organization providing small, uh, social services, community development, small business lending, and affordable housing development for New York City's Asian Americans, as well as for low-income communities from all backgrounds and needs of our services. I'll also note that we're an experienced nonprofit affordable housing developer. Um, we've developed and preserved about 600 units of affordable housing in almost 40 buildings, primarily in Lower Manhattan. We are the owners of a parcel of land located at 141 Montgomery Street in Brooklyn. This is adjacent to 40 Crown Street. This is within the rezoning area adjacent to the applicant's property. We had purchased the parcel at a nominal fee from Enterprise Community Partners several years ago for the purposes of long-term affordable housing development. The land comes with deed restrictions that require consent from New York City Housing Preservation and Development for development and it has always been our mission and intent to create fully affordable housing. Over the years, we have attempted negotiations with our neighbor, first Cornell Realty and now Carmel Partners to see if there was an opportunity for partnership to increase the number of affordable units and positive community impact. Unfortunately, we have not reached terms that were agreeable to our organization's nonprofit mission and no partnership was ever realized. We have followed this series of public hearings and events over the past weeks and have heard the concerns raised by the local community. AFI does not wish to become a wedge during this contentious process, and through careful internal deliberation with our board, we have come up with the following guidelines whereby we will be receptive to a partnership with Carmel Partners. You have those guidelines there, so I won't read them. I would like to, I would like to hear them. Okay. That's pretty critical. Um, so those guidelines include that one, Carmel via a land swap or land contribution to our site 
contributes to a doubling of affordable units built under the proposed R8X rezoning. More than what is possible under um, the current lot configuration and current uh, six, R6A zoning. Carmel must also fulfill their minimum mandatory inclusionary housing requirements and not count the affordable units created by AFI towards the required MIH affordable unit number. AFI and Carmel would commit to direct public input with the local community board, elected officials, and local residents to determine the ideal bedroom types, unit types, and AMI bands. To the greatest extent possible, the design and massing of the new larger development should have no shadow impact on the botanical gardens. The affordable units on both AFI and Carmel sites should have the maximum local community preference in the housing lottery allowable by the fair housing law. And all affordable units generated from this rezoning will be affordable in perpetuity and fully enforceable by city deed covenant and regulatory agreements. We thank you for your attention and allowing us to submit our testimony. Thank you, I have one uh, additional question. I am extremely pleased that you are here today. Um, is part of your partnership or idea when you talk about massing, um, is it to combine the properties to build, let's say, one development or that your thought process would be to keep the spaces separate? Um, I guess uh, on one hand to be sensitive to the developer um, and the fact that they're in the middle of this land use review process, presumably they would not want their project to be delayed, right? Um, so from a practical perspective, assuming that, um, I think we're envisioning a scenario where they might contribute other property that would then allow us to build a, a larger project and therefore produce more affordable units um, and ensure that all of those units are um, permanently affordable. Thank you very much and I look forward to having further conversation following this hearing and um, hoping that the negotiations continue to move forward with the recommendations that you've put forward. We are looking at development scenarios and so <coughs> we look forward to the opportunity to share that with you and with Carmel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, District Leader Jeffrey Davis. One, one second, sorry. one second. Uh, we are also joined by Zach uh, Bomer. Uh, you're also part of uh, AFI. AFI. Are, are you here to? Okay. Sorry about that. Do you want me to speak, Zach? You want me to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, push, turn on your mic and. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon. Hey, everyone, all right, uh, Jeffrey Davis. Um, a uh, long-time resident of Crown Heights, uh, 50 years or so, um, uh, 25 years activist improving Central Brooklyn, particularly Crown Heights, uh, 15 years as a victim slash survivor of violence, uh, and four years as a Democratic district leader in this particular area. So I got a handle on what's going on in this particular area. Um, we are faced with a project of, as of right, as of right, 200 or so apartments, whether we engage or not. But they're willing to do affordable housing with some extra apartments that we can benefit from. Um, I'm for it because there's a housing crisis. People need a place to live, period. Simple as that. If they're willing to give more apartments, for this particular community to have a place to live, that's wonderful. Right down the block is a shelter that we fought for to have permanent affordable housing as opposed to temporary housing. This gives an opportunity for the people in the shelter to, have to transition to permanent affordable housing, which is right down the block. They get a chance to stay in this particular area. Um, I'm a, I am a, a supporter of the garden, uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I do a lot of things there over the years. And we have a letter from the president stating that it has no impact, this particular project has no impact on the garden. So the, the garden says not this project, but other projects they'll be testifying for, but not this particular project. So they did their study and they submitted a letter to city planning said that it has zero impact. This particular project on their, on their, on the garden, on our garden. So I'm comfortable with that. We need 
uh, affordable housing. If 25% from this project, 25% from the other project, 25% from the other projects, collectively that's 100% and people have a place to live. Now, yes, training programs are extremely important. My thing is training programs in the healthcare field, uh, personal care assistant, home health aides, and uh, uh, scholarships. We will continue to address violence in this area through partnering with the developers, with scholarships, training programs, um, health care programs and the like, and people from the neighborhood when they do construction and so forth, jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Demetrius Hawkins. Um, I was a resident, a resident of the Crown Heights community. I'm now living in a shelter in Manhattan, and um, I think this project would help us out a lot because it would help us to get permanent housing with low income. Um, we've been in the shelter for a while now and it would just be a good thing just to have our own place and be able to afford the apartment. So I think this project would be very helpful for us. Let me ask you a question. Have you, during the time that you have been in shelter, have you been assisted or supported in applying for any of our housing lotteries? Um, there's very little assistance, but um, there's a website that you could go on, and if you're connected to the website, they send you all the different apartments that you are able to apply for, the apartments for lottery and different housing. But where you are in Manhattan in shelter, is there a system set up where you're constantly able to have access to support to individuals, to people that can help you along the way throughout the application process, whether it's helping to fill out the forms, whether it's helping to um, create an application that makes you eligible? There are people, but I don't think there's enough. I think they need help in that area. Okay, I'd love to talk with you more about that. Okay. Um, but thank you, yeah. Chair Moya. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Barron has a few questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question uh, for Ms. Sun. And you say in your testimony that you purchased, prop you purchased the parcel at 141 Montgomery Street. Uh, how much did you pay for it? I don't know the purchase price, but I can find out. Okay, when did you purchase it? A few years ago. Um, so I have to apologize, I was appointed co-ED in July. Um, and I am just learning about our real estate portfolio in terms of the details. But again, I'm happy to follow up with the information. And where are you in your uh, project to develop housing, affordable housing? How far along are you in that goal? For this particular site or just that in site. general? For this site, uh, we have not been actively looking at uh, redeveloping this site. Um, we were interested in seeing how this, might, this process might unfold before pursuing that further. Okay, so you're, what is your position on the project as it currently exists? I think we share the community's concerns about the amount of affordable housing that would be developed as a result of this rezoning. And what about the density, the height of the project? Um, I think also we're sensitive to the community's concerns about the impacts that it might have with the surrounding community and the garden. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel. Um, are there any other uh, members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. But thank you. Our next uh, public hearing is on LUs 272, 273, 274, 275, 276, 277, the Marcus Garvey Village rezoning. Uh, LNM Development Partners seek a zoning map amendment to change portions of the existing R6 zoning district to an R72 and R72 uh, C24 districts, a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, a special permit to modify allowable 
lot coverage, height, setback, and distance between buildings, and a special permit to waive parking requirements in order to facilitate the development of seven new mixed-use buildings with approximately 676 affordable housing units on unused portions of the existing Marcus Garvey, Garvey uh, Village uh, housing development in Brownsville. Uh, NYC HPD is uh, the applicant for disposition of city-owned property to allow LNM to acquire and incorporate two small pieces of city-owned vacant land into two of the development sites, and the NYC DPR is the applicant for site selection and acquisition approval for a 5,200 square foot parcel uh, located across Bristol Street from Betsy Head Park to become a community garden. Folks, if you can uh, please close the door or keep it down. Uh, the proposed uh, new mixed use development will create uh, seven new uh, seven to eight story buildings. Uh, to be built in at least three phases with approximately 676 affordable dwelling units. The property affected is located in Council Member Barron's district and in Council Member Amprey Samuels district in Brooklyn. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application uh, and I will call up, uh, well before I do that, uh, Councilwoman, do you have any uh, remarks before we begin? Okay. okay. Uh, we will call up the first panel, uh, Richard uh, Lobel, uh, Joshua uh, Weistek, uh, Gen Genevieve Michael, and Lisa Gomez. Uh, Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Before responding, please state your name, making sure that the red light is on on the mic. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? I do. Richard Lobel. Uh, Genevieve Michael, I do. Lisa Gomez, I do. Josh Weistuck, I do. <laughs> you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya, Council Members. Uh, Richard Lobel from Sheldon Lobel, and I'm joined by l and Development Partners with regards to the Marvis Garvey extension. Uh, briefly, this uh, proposal involves a series of zoning actions which require us to go through ULERP, which include a rezoning of parcels from R6 to R72 C and R72 C23, as well as a large scale general development. Uh, and in addition, um, certain other zoning actions, including a text amendment to map the area with a mandatory inclusionary housing designated area. So I would uh, turn this over to Josh, who will run through the presentation, and the panel is available to answer any questions. Thanks, Richard. Um, so I'll give you a brief history first. Between 2014 and 2016, LM rehabilitated the 625-unit complex that spans 10 city blocks known as Marcus Garvey Village. Since completing the rehab, the near 100 vacant units, which were one of many symptoms of the disrepair at the complex in 2014 is now over a one-year wait list. Safety enhancements across the sites with security cameras and increased staffing has significantly decreased crime. An overall quality of life for residents is improved. Additionally, we exceeded state, uh, local, and MWB hiring goals during the rehab work. Um, l and makes every effort to engage with residents Marcus Garvey's Family Day is back as a result of a, the strong TA and ownership listening to residents. Residents continue to pay rents no greater than 60% AMI as governed by the s state low-income housing tax credit and mitchell Lama regimes, and the project will remain affordable for 40 years. Um, l and involved other organizations at Marcus Garvey. A needs survey was conducted by the Sabaeth Group that provided helpful information of what residents would like to see at the site. In response, we brought on Project Eats that has provided the community with affordable, fresh produce and now has a fresh juice cafe. There's a summer camp and after school program um, in the community room at Marcus Garvey uh, provided by Grand Street Settlement. And BCJC built and now runs a youth clubhouse and center in response for the need for youth programming. Uh, while the Marcus Garvey project is running well, we aim to further enhance the neighborhood and facilities and activate Brown the Brownsville community with the council's approval of this proposal. 
So what are the actions? Uh, Richard just went through a few of them. Uh, essentially, we are adding a com commercial overlay to the resident existing residential district to allow retail along Livonia Avenue. There's a zoning tax amendment to establish mandatory inclusionary housing to ensure affordability. There's, um, we're looking to increase the open space and green space um, and add density for, for the open space and green space and create efficient buildings. So to that end, there's a special permit to blend lot coverage throughout the development. Uh, we've um, brokered an agreement with the Green Thumb from the Department of Parks. They have a site that's 3,000 square feet adjacent to one of the developments, and we're swapping that with a 6,000 square foot site owned by the applicant. Um, so they're doubling in size, and they have a, a space that's actually closer to the operator, the MHBA Academy. Um, there's a disposition acquisition of an HPD-owned vacant lot adjacent to Site E and a special permit to waive the existing parking requirements. So here's a site plan. Um, the dark gray, seven dark gray buildings are the development sites. A, B, C, D, and E go up and down along Livonia on, on either side. F and G are uh, at either ends on the left and right uh, of the T shape of the development. The lighter gray and green is the existing Marcus Garvey. Uh, what are the benefits to, to the Brownsville residents? Uh, this project will <clears throat> uh, maximize opportunities for affordable housing, uh, generate ground, uh, ground floor retail and community facility. There are jobs uh, generated both in the construction, ongoing maintenance, and uh, generated also by the tenant, by the occupants of the retail and community facility. will eliminate underutilized space um, from the lots and inherent with the development there's improved security and lighting along Livonia and the project includes youth and senior programming and other opportunities for resources to be used by the community. Here's a rendering of uh, the site going down in Livonia. You've got, um, we're not saying that these are going to be the uses but uh, it's just a rendering to activate the corridor along Livonia. So to, um, who did I skip page? Sorry, uh, numerous versions of this plan that started uh, with a 12 story development um, a couple of years ago, now tops out at eight stories at, two, at the two outer buildings, F and G, and seven stories at the rest. Uh, don't bother squinting your eyes. This diagram is for illustrative purposes and I'll detail them in a moment. The point is after meeting with the council members and we've made many cuts to the building passings, we've increased parking in an effort to achieve a development that works for the community. Based on our, uh, our conversations with the council members, we worked with the community board's equity planning committee on an MOU. We agreed to incorporate 32BJ as part of the ongoing maintenance of the site once it's completed. And we've reached out to tenants um, with backyards facing the development sites. So the development includes uh, between 625 and 675 units of affordable housing across seven build buildings to be built over the next six or so years. As mentioned in the prior side, city planning certified a denser development. Efforts were made to reduce bulk and increase parking at the cost of community facility space. We now have financeable buildings that max out at eight stories. To exemplify the cuts, I've pulled out two typical conditions. One is along Livonia. Uh, this is a building that uh, we pushed the rear wall away from the Marcus, existing Marcus Garvey building, and we've reduced the introduced a setback um, at that same location. Uh, at the request of the council members. And at buildings G and F, this is an example of building G, we've reduced the, we've eliminated the top floor, so it's now eight stories high, and we've decreased the street walls to five stories. The large scale plan consists of buildings similar to other city sponsored sites uh, and developments along Livonia, both in size and AMI levels. This is um, 
the projected unit distribution. Um, it will conform to the available city term sheets, or city or state term sheets at the time. And as far as distribution, we're assuming something like this. Um, it's in line with the council members uh, it, that in, in that there's a healthy mix of two and three bedroom units. There has been discussion of the senior building, which would skew the mix somewhat to the studio and one bedroom sizes. And we continue talks with city and state agencies on available funding for senior housing. The project will have uh, rents as low as $215 for studio units um, and have AMI levels tiered at 60% and below for 80% of the units. And the balance of the units will be between 60 and 80% AMI. The um, projects will be funded. Phase one, we're anticipating HCR's shop term sheet. Uh, and then phase two would be HPD and HDC's ELLA term sheet. Um, the uh, So at the beginning of the ULR process, we signed an MOU with the Community Board Equity Planning Committee, which highlights working together to identify retail and community facility operators, maximize affordability, increase parking, which you've already done, and we strive to hire local and MWBE entities. Should we receive the green light to move forward, we anticipate closing on phase one um, at the end of 2019, so construction would anticipate to start in early 2020. Phase two, potentially um, mid, 2020 and phase, phases three and four would stagger bet uh, between the start date of 2021, 2022 with an estimated completion in 2024. So thank you for your time and we open the floor to questions. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. maybe not questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, L&M spoke about the project as a whole. I wanna just quickly speak to the city's actions. Uh, my name is Genevieve Michael from HPD. Uh, so as you heard, the project area consists of private sites as well as city-owned property located at Block 3587, Lot 27, and Block 3588, Lots 32 through 36. The city-owned property accounts for approximately 5,517 square feet of the development area, or approximately 4% of the project area. The city-owned lots were once designated urban renewal sites as part of the Marcus Garvey Urban Renewal Plan. Uh, URP, which was approved in 1968. Although the URP expired in 2008, the city-owned sites will be developed with residential uses as originally envisioned. Uh, to briefly summarize the portion of the UR action in which HPD is a co-applicant, we are seeking approval of disposition pursuant to 197C of Block 3587, Lot 27, and Block 3588, Lots 32 through 36, in order to convey the land to the sponsor, Brownsville Livonia South Housing Development Fund Corporation, Currently, Block 3588, lots 32 through 36, are a green thumb garden currently under the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks and Recreation. And Block 3587, lot 27, is an unimproved vacant lot under the jurisdiction of HPD. The sponsor is proposing to develop the project under HPD's uh, extremely low and low affordable program. Under the ELLA program, sponsors purchase city-owned or privately owned sites and construct multifamily rental housing affordable to low-income families with a range of incomes from 30% to 80% of the area median income. Projects may include a tier of units with rents affordable to households earning up to 100% of AMI and subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless families and individuals. The buildings that will be developed on the city-owned sites and adjacent privately owned lots on development sites C and E will have a mixture of unit types, um, which LM spoke to. Additionally, the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services are co-applicants for the site selection and acquisition of the property located at 3559, uh, part of lot one. Given the city will be conveying the existing garden site, which measures approximately 3,000 square feet to the sponsor, the acquisition and site selection by the city of the 5,236 square feet acquisition and the 892 square feet easement area for use as a community garden. The new community garden on the acquisition site and easement area will be approximately 6,128 square feet, more than twice the size of the existing uh, approximately 3,000 square feet community garden. 
Um, and now I think we can open it up to questions. Uh, thank you. I just want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Member Amprey Samuels. Uh, just a few questions before I turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, I knew that you had mentioned in the presentation the modifications to the setbacks. Um, uh, are those in line with the recommendations from the local members and the borough president? Basically, yes. We, we met with the council members, I guess, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and reviewed them. There were some discrepancies between what the borough president and the, um, the council members' calculations, but I think they're in the spirit of, of what the borough president um, was recommending. We did speak to the borough president's land use staff and let him know that we were in discussions with the council members. Okay. Um, for the sites on Livonia Avenue, uh, how will the project mitigate the noise from the elevated subway tracks? So we've built a number of buildings along subway tracks uh, pursuant to um, CEQA and other environmental regulations. Windows have to be double and triple glazed. We're going to minimize the amount of windows that we need to put along Livonia. For example, if you're at a corner facing Chester and Livonia, we'd have a, a blank wall on the Livonia side. Um, there are a number of projects up and down Livonia that have been built in this fashion. Okay. Uh, and there's, this is a large scale project with you know, seven development sites and I know you touched a little bit of, uh, about senior housing but has there, can you go into a little bit deeper of uh, those conversations in regards to uh, bringing in senior housing to this project? So we know that there is a, a need in, in many, many communities across the city for aging, aging populations and aging in place. There are not a ton of, of available funding programs, and we're, we're not, we certainly can't say that anyone's committed to funding it. We know it's an interest. Um, it's something we're going to pursue, and hopefully with the help of the community and the electeds, we'll be successful. Um, you know, we're very happy to do it. We think it would be great for the neighborhood, but we cannot represent that anyone has committed to fund it yet. Right. And uh, what uh, resiliency and uh, sustainability measures are planned for this project, uh, solar panels, rain gardens? We, we always consider solar panels in all our rehab and, and new construction. At the existing Marcus Garvey, we brought in a, four, a 500 kilowatt uh, solar grid, as well as a fuel cell, the first in the city, that produces electricity from natural gas. And we also have a battery that helps shave peak loads and, and get off of Con Ed's grid during peak hours. So there's, there is potential to actually tap into some of that existing um, structure at the existing Marcus Garvey. And of course we'll do enterprise green communities and local fixtures and LED lights um, and the suite of available efficiencies uh, for, for the new buildings. Great, I'm also very glad to hear that there's been a commitment to good jobs on this uh, project. Uh, I think that's uh, a great way to start. Um, and the last question is, can we just go back to the uh, AMI breakdowns and the size of each unit? Give it, is it a question, do you want us to review it? Just, yeah. Okay, we'll review it. Okay, so this is the, the rent range for uh, the typical studio to three bedroom based on the AMIs of, of 30 to six, uh, I believe that's for 60% AMI. And um, as- Wait, the, the three bedroom is at what? You said? It, it depends on the, the diff we have different AMIs. So we have okay. we right. have either of the- Yeah, so the 60% AMI, or do you want rents or incomes? Incomes. So, okay, so incomes would be th for 30%. Uh, for a family, for a single person, twenty-one thousand nine hundred. For a family of four, it goes up to thirty-one thousand. Um, and then uh, at the max for sixty percent, it's forty-three thousand eight hundred for a single person, up to sixty-two thousand five hundred eighty for a family of four. Got it. And um, as far as the tiering uh, for the sixty percent and below, we're going to work with the agencies. Uh, 
to meet their term sheets and also make sure that we can finance the buildings. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Council uh, Member Barron uh, for a few questions. Uh, I'll defer to my colleague because she's still in her heels. No problem. Uh, we will now turn it over to uh, Council Member Anthony Samuels. I appreciate that. Uh, first, I want to say um, thank you so much. We've had um, a, a lot of meetings over the past several months, and I appreciate the, the back and forth and um, making every attempt to incorporate our um, um, ideas and, and feedback. I have a question about the local hiring piece. Um, can you just describe the conversations that you've had with um, local groups or residents um, related to um, the hiring um, with this project, as well as um, opportunities for um, folks in the community to be employed on um, other projects that you have throughout the city? Because you are working on a good number of development projects throughout New York. And um, I just feel like a good faith gesture or a, a way to really be able to um, partner with the community is seeing if they, there are opportunities right now today on some of your other sites. So can you ex just speak to the conversations that you've had? Absolutely, I'll, I'll take them in, in, in pieces. So um, we maintain a team of folks um, within, our, within our company whose job is to uh, handle outreach, make connections and help uh, companies become certified uh, MWBE companies. We are required to, uh, when we do a state job, the, we, we must use state certified companies. The city's more flexible, the state's less flexible. Um, so we have already begun to attend local um, job fair, uh, sorry, hiring fairs. We've been to uh, LDC of East New York. I think we've been to three so far. We know our job is fairly far out, so it's, we haven't done a ton. Um, usually those get going probably nine months or so before we, we actually start bidding our work. Um, but we have made those, some of those connections. We have built in this neighborhood before, so we do have some of those relationships. Um, I'm very proud of our, of our MNWBE hiring record. I, we've hired, uh, we've spent, about, this year alone, we've spent about 400 million to MNWBE companies throughout all of our projects, not just on, on any given project. And that represents about 20, mm, I, I'm not sure exactly where we are in the, the overall denominator, but plus 20% of our, of our total spend. On the local hiring uh, phase, we work primarily through Building Skills, which is a, no a, a citywide nonprofit that um, helps uh, connect people to training and jobs. We fund some of the training, the OSHA training, um, and that's available. We'd love to talk more about that. We're happy to refer people now. Even though we don't have a job, we can certainly help with referrals of uh, neighborhood residents into the Building Skills uh, program. We also work with Green City Force, where we've had um, a really great track record. Uh, we started with them on uh, the NYCHA buildings. Um, some of our best, some of my favorite stories are when somebody comes in as a, a, a youth who is uh, underemployed or unemployed, goes through a training program, works in construction, and gets a job. Um, we have some uh, working in the building and building services and then works his or her way up. And we do have a number of those success stories. Another of our partners, Grand Street Settlement, has um, worked with us uh, both on, in the Lower East Side and... Um, so not to cut you off, just in the interest of time. So we have um, organizations that are currently working right there in Brownsville. We so will work we with them. To, um, we will Brownsville work with Think Tank. We, we um, you know, work directly with Man Up. And yep. so um, have you had direct um, conversations and um, work directly with yes. the young people, young men and women who are in their programs and said, okay, can you send me a list of folks that have this particular skill set and we can get them employed on um, this particular site in the Bronx or this so particular site. We, we have had conversations. We, I think Brownsville Think Tank, I'm not sure if they're 
still here. Brownsville Think Tank Matters is here, as is Grand Street. Um, we, I can't answer if we've gotten anyone employed. I will find out the answer to that for you. Um, we have these conversations with every elected in, that in every neighborhood in which we work. Um, everyone wants their folks in. So I, I don't know if we The reason why I ask that question is because I had um, conversations in the past with, um, with, with you all, and I remember having a conversation about building skills. And when I went to the website, I saw that there was, I want to say maybe in August, there was a, um, an opportunity for a job fair and um, dug deeper into the number of positions that were available. And at that time, it was 74 positions that were available. And they listed the type of jobs. Right. And they were all, if you have an OSHA 30, if you have um, uh, you know, a license or certificate as a plumber. And, and these were all jobs that when I looked around the community, you know, folks have that skill set. And um, then uh, the conversation turned into, well, if you submit the names of folks, then we can get them hired. So we sent our people to the um, fairs and well, whatever this particular fair was with building skills and no one was hired. And so I'm just trying to figure out if there's some um, like conversations being had with the organizations and maybe the people that we sent directly just weren't connected or not part of the network and they didn't know that they were coming from our office or coming from our community. So I'm just trying to, you know, I, like I get don't know. Some kind I can't concrete. speak to that. And I wasn't I don't aware that you had time, sent, but, but I'm happy to follow up afterwards and, and figure out forensically what happened there, and, and if if that process broke, we'll fix it. Okay. All right. And um, the last thing I see on uh, that's part of Phase One sites B and D that sit on my side of my side of the tracks, right? <laughs> my <laughs> district, <laughs> literally. Um, that's with um, shop and state funding. Correct. And um, there's also supportive housing included with these developments. So can you just speak to the populations that are gonna be targeted um, within the supportive housing? So and um, is there a set aside for uh, homeless families or individuals? So I think that's to? something we wanna, uh, it's, it's something we heard sort of both sides of throughout the conversation with the community in terms of concerns as well as opportunities. So I think we'd wanna talk, before we sort of settle on a population, I think we'd wanna talk with you all about uh, sort of what makes sense as well as providers who make sense. So um, I think that's a, that's a conversation that you know, we'll wanna engage with you all and, and probably others a little bit more deeply. Okay, so you you have not had no, these conversations. No, we have, and no, 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 we have not had these conversations. It's, the state's not even gonna talk to us until early in the new year. So I think we've got time. Um, you know, we, we're probably over a year away from closing. And this is really my last. Um, uh, we mentioned um, the, the like our goal um, to make sure that there's real ownership in our community and everyone has a peer, you know a part of the process and have a piece of the pie. Um, can you speak to um, your ideas around community land trusts? Sure, as we've, we've talked about in over the past few months, um, it's an idea we're more than willing to explore. We've spoken to folks at HPD as well as some academics. I think there needs to be some further work done. I think the industry is nascent. Um, there isn't a community land trust group in the neighborhood yet. Um, we remain open to that conversation and we will help to, to work on it. Um, I don't, you, you've had more recent conversations with HPD, I think. Yeah, um, the, there are city uh, efforts to kind of get this thing off the ground and moving, and we're happy to stay plugged in, but this is something that comes from the community. The community develops the, the community land trust and then works with the developer. So we are open to working with uh, a local community land trust. I think there's also some technical assistance providers. Genevieve, do you, can you speak to that a little? Um, I can't speak in depth <laughs> because I am certainly not the HPD Community Land Trust expert, um, but I know that folks are definitely working on it. We've heard, you know, I think loud and clear from several council members that there is an interest in strengthening uh, community land trust and figuring out a way to make it work. Um, so certainly happy to continue those conversations and I can, you know, help push to make sure that, that that's happening the way that it should be. Thing we, uh, timing of developing that is there is a, a long lead time, but this is something that you know we we will remain open to. It's not something that has to get set in stone when we close. 
So um, we're willing to be flexible. Thank you so much, Chair Moya, for your leadership, and thank you so much for allowing me the time, um, Councilmember Barron. Thank you, um, Councilmember. Uh, now I turn it over to Councilmember um, to uh, follow up with questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel for coming. And uh, it's been a battle, struggle, getting here, but I want to echo the comments of my colleague that we've had a very good working relationship in terms of making adjustments to the plan that was originally presented perhaps some three years ago or thereabouts. So I do appreciate that. And I also want to acknowledge the improvements that have been made at the existing Marcus Garvey Village uh, and that you now have 100% occupancy and waiting lists for people to get in. So we want to make sure that that's on the record. As many people probably know, you know, my target is six stories and you came with 12, which was twice as much as what I have. But I do appreciate the fact that you went back, made modifications and reduced the height to eight and seven story buildings and that has not gone unnoticed. We do thank you for that. We also want to acknowledge the fact that uh, you did respond to the request to increase parking. I don't know if that came up earlier in our discussion, and that is a very critical issue. When you're talking about bringing in 600 more units, we certainly need to recognize the fact that there's going to be parking that's needed. I want to acknowledge you have reduced the bulk, as we talked about, and also that your history talks about MWBE local hires and we're looking to make sure that that same record that you have brought continues. I believe in looking at people's history, looking at their past. You can make all kinds of promises about what will go on in the future, but your past speaks to me as to what I can expect to go forward, to see in the future going forward. I do have other questions. So in terms of the AMI bands, I see your chart here which talks about affordability and which talks about the rent range and a studio apartment uh, ranging from 215 to $837. That's important to me because in our community, as you know, the AMI is about $34,000. That's the median income basically in my community. So that speaks to recognizing I'm not supporting shifting the people who have gone through the hard times and now have an opportunity to participate in new, uh, lug not luxury, but uh, well-apportioned properties to be able to benefit from that and to apply for that. What is the size of the studio apartment? We know, we know that you don't like small studios, but our plan is to follow the HPD design guidelines, which is a minimum studio size of 400 square feet. 400. And in terms of your commitment to 80% of the housing at or below 60% 60 60 of the AMI, I would still want to know what were the income bands, how many at 30, at 40, at 60, at 70. I would like to know what you're projecting to be the number of apartments at each of those bands. So I think it's a, without sort of having the financing nailed down, it's a little bit difficult to tell you specifically by building. I think we have it for B and D, right? Do you have it for B and D? Um, yeah, it's. I mean, we're, again, it's based on what the conversations are with the state. So we we can discuss uh, where we are today with B and D. Um, and again, there's always new term sheets that come out, so we'll be subject to those in the future. Right. We so everyone sort of follows the same term sheets, and there, there's, you know, there, the, the agencies sort of prescribe the different um, levels. It, do you have the shop term sheet? Yes. I think we have the shop term sheet. Yeah, okay. I know you ran these numbers. 
right. And that, I so I, we'll come back to you. I, we okay. have we have it we have it we have a better breakdown for B and D than we do the rest because that's further along in the conversations. Okay. So uh, we'll look to see what it what it is for A, C, and E, which, as has been noted, is on my side of the tracks, and we mean that literally for those people who are who are not familiar, right. because there is a train track. The the uh, number three train goes along Livonia, and the northern part belongs to my colleague in her district, and the southern part is uh, in district council district 42. So on A, C, and E, uh, the, which would theoretically mm -hmm. HPD and HDC tell us, remember, we haven't committed to you yet. Um, the, the term sheets read at 10% um, at 30, 10% at 40, 10% at 50, and the remaining units up to 60 is the current term sheet. 10, 10, 10 for 30, 40, 50. And, and 10 for formerly homeless. 10 for formerly homeless. So that's basically 40% below 60 with the remainder being at 60. Okay. And, and uh, the other questions that I have regard the senior building. Where are we in terms of getting a firm determination on the senior building? We won't be able to sort of have those financing conversations till early in the new year with either the state or the city. So phase one will include which sites? B and D. B and D. And we had spoken about uh, additional community benefits in terms of agreement, an agreement that your company might offer so that the community will not just get the opportunity to have these beautiful new apartments, but also other general community benefits. So where are you in that kind of discussion? So as, as we mentioned, we will continue some of the programming that we've done at Marcus Garvey in terms of after school, uh, youth, uh, anti-violence work. We will work with a subcommittee of the community board to advise us on uh, ground floor uses, be they community facility or retail along Livonia. Um, we will work, we will continue dialogue with the community board in terms of making sure they're updated on progress um, as we have been. And if there, there are other sort of specific things that folks are, are interested in, we're, we're more than willing to engage. In terms of phase three, do you expect that the same affordability will be applied in phase three as in the other phases? Generally, yes. And the larger buildings that are a part of uh, phase three, we had talked about more than just two elevators based on the fact that these are rather long buildings. Have we talked about adding additional elevators so that people don't get up in the middle and have to walk long distances? So to we, we haven't really massed those buildings beyond you know, really what we've shown you. Um, as we, we get further in development, we will study the, um, the how, how those units break out and will elevator them appropriately. And the commercial space that's going to exist, I'm really excited about the project. I think that it uh, reflects what our community is entitled to in terms of having nice new construction and it reflects the population that currently lives there, which as I said, has an income of about $34,000 for a family of three. In terms of the commercial space on the ground floor, have you given consideration to having affordable rental fees for the commercials that will, commercial activity that will take place there? I think we're very open to understanding how, that, how we could make that happen. I think it's pretty tough for affordable housing to cross-subsidize commercial space. So. I think we're, we're open to creative ideas. I think we'll apply to the state for what they call SIF funds, which is um, commercial revitalization funds that, that help sort of buy down the cost of construction. There are not a ton of resources out there for commercial stuff, but I think we're, 
all ears and would be eager to work with you and council member Samuel in terms of identifying other ones. Thank you. I just want to again commend you for all of the accommodations that you've made to the requests and concerns that my colleague and I have had and look forward to coming to the conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member Barron. Um, thank you for the panel. Thank you for your testimony today. Okay. Uh, we're going to now resume the vote. <clears throat> and I just want to acknowledge Council Member Torres and Council Member Powers have joined us uh, today. Thank you. Uh, this is a continued vote to approve land use items 260, 261, 262, and 263. Torres. I vote aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, no negatives, and no abstentions, and referred to the full, full land use committee. And we'll leave it open uh, again. Thank you. I will call. Now, I will call up the next panel now. Um, Clovis Thorne, Zamir Khan. Siam Smith, last name Smith. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Let's start with uh, Zamir. Uh, just uh, turn on your microphone. Uh, say uh, your name and you may begin. My name is Zamir Khan. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Moya and members of the subcommittee. I'm here speaking on behalf of uh, Local 32 BJ. Uh, I'm a doorman from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, I've been uh, working with uh, 32 BJ for the past nine years. I'm here uh, representing the members of our union and our 19 union brothers and sisters who are porters and handymen at the Marcus Garvey Apartments. Um, 32BJ, as you may know, we represent 80,000 building service workers across the city, and we're here today to express our strong support for the Marcus Garvey infill project proposed by Brownsville Livonia Associates, LLC, an affiliate of L&M Development Partners, Marcus Garvey Preservation, LLC, and the city. We estimate that the infill project will generate about 10 new building service jobs that will most likely be filled in the local community. We're hoping that it is filled in the local community. We're happy to report that the applicants of this ULERP have committed that these jobs will be good jobs that pay prevailing wages and give workers dignity. Uh, that's close, it hits close to home for me because these are the kind of jobs that enabled my father, a 40 year member of 32BJ, to provide for myself and my siblings growing up. And now as a 32BJ member, I'm allowed to provide for my two children and my family as well. Uh, HPD's commitment to support community objectives around affordable housing and economic opportunity throughout the Brownsville plan is thoroughly executed by the Marcus Garvey infill project. And we at 32BJ believe that the project should be looked at as an example for affordable projects that are su subsided throughout city financing. The creation of 724 units of affordable housing and a commitment to good prevailing wage jobs sets a precedent for affordable housing projects that uplift working families. For these reasons, we, respect, we respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. My name is Cyrus Smith. I'm a program advisor with uh, Brownsville Think Tank Matters. Uh, we are a local, reputable, uh, community-based organization. Uh, we do receive uh, joint funding uh, for our workforce development and our uh, violence uh, reduction initiatives uh, from both uh, l and Development and uh, Dunn Development. Uh, we are currently working uh, with l and Development and its Marcus Scarvey residents on those initiatives, uh, and we have had great success. Um, uh, to date, uh, we've been able to train over 120 people in public safety careers uh, that focuses on uh, security. Uh, and what that allows is uh, the uh, residents uh, to secure, you know, like an eight, 16 hour um, security license and go into entry level careers that start paying at about 15 to $16 an hour. Uh, after three months uh, of employment, uh, they tend to go into union positions and they're 
uh, wages uh, go up upwards of about 40, anywhere from 36, you know, to $42,000. And we're seeing great success there. Uh, with our OSHA training and certification, uh, we do enjoy a good relationship with our building skills. Uh, our records indicate that uh, we were able to have six successful uh, placements uh, with building skills. Uh, as our uh, participants completed their 30 hour OSHA training, those who had more experience was able to go through the building skills process and find uh, some employment. Uh, however, uh, we do have a, a lot of uh, resources in community where uh, we do ask residents to uh, build on their social capital. Uh, so once we have our uh, OSHA training, our residents are prepared to go into their own network and find employment um, on their own. But we do use other resources uh, such as Workforce One, uh, the Jobs Plus Center, and again, uh, our uh, participants tend uh, to find work uh, in their area. Uh, we do support this initiative as uh, we are in community and we feel if you activate those lots with additional housing, uh, we'll you know, like increase uh, uh, public safety concerns. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Clovis Thorne. I am with Grand Street Settlement. Uh, Grand Street Settlement is a 102-year-old community service, services provider in New York. We provide uh, intergenerational services, everything from pre-K to senior centers, uh, to around 10,000 families in New York City a year across the Lower East Side in Brooklyn uh, at 28 different sites, and over half of our sites are in Brooklyn. We've been involved at uh, Marcus Garvey Apartments since L&M has been involved as a grantee um, directly from L&M to run after-school programs uh, in the community rooms at the apartments. Um, that has proved very successful. In fact, it was uh, so highly sought that we, uh, they gave us an additional grant to add summer programming at the apartments. This is just one example of uh, the incredible need in the area for community services. Uh, we run several other uh, community centers, mostly NYCHA Cornerstone Community Centers in the neighborhood. Uh, nearby uh, in East New York at Unity Plaza, our community center is oversubscribed by 200%. So we have waiting lists for these programs. Um, we very much support this project and this expansion. Uh, L&M has been a thoughtful partner on this and other projects. And we are interested in continuing this partnership to bring high quality community services to families in Brownsville. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Thank you, and, and we'll resume uh, in, in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Um, now for our last hearing, uh, which is on LU uh, 269, the Garment Center Text Amendment, the Department of City Planning and the City's Economic Development Corporation are proposing a zoning text amendment to modify the special uh, garment center district to lift manufacturing preservation requirements that exist on side, uh, side street blocks. Standardized sign regulations modify bulk regulations to ensure conformance to historical context and establish a special permit for hotels. Uh, the property affected is located in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. Um, and I now open the public hearing on this application. Um, I just want to make sure we have all the panelists here. Um, Dylan Sandler, uh, Cecilia Kushner, uh, Edith Suchen, and James Padgett. Great. Uh, council, please swear in the panel. Before responding, please make sure the light on your mic is on and also state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? James Padgett, I do. Cecilia Kushner, I do. Edith Suchen, I do. <coughs> Dylan Sandler, I do. Great, thank you. Uh, and now I want. Uh, now I want to turn it over to um, Speaker Johnson for um, some remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Moya, for uh, the opportunity to deliver a few brief remarks before we hear from the administration. I want to begin by acknowledging uh, the partnership that we have had with Borough President Gail Brewer, uh, the administration, myself, and many of the stakeholders and other local elected officials. The Borough President has, over the course of more than two years, pulled many of us together to debate and develop strategies for preserving the fashion incubator that is the Garment District. I also want to recognize the hard work and dedication of many of the participants of the Garment Steering Committee who developed the ideas and recommendations that we now have in front of us. And I want to thank the agencies that are with us today, the Economic Development Corporation led by President James Patchett, who has been a great partner in this work, and the Department of City Planning for their willingness to accept feedback and to change course when needed and necessary. Before we hear from the agencies, I want to offer a few thoughts on the text amendment that is before us today. Many New Yorkers have deep ties to the Garment District. For decades, it was the place where people came from all over the world and found their first job and in many cases built a company. A hundred years ago, most women's clothing made in the United States of America was made in the Garment District. The energy of the Garment District created the impetus for Parsons and later FIT, and it is where the Council of Fashion Designers was born. There are countless stories here of fashion designers like Ralph Lauren doing their first production run in the Garment District and literally rolling a rack of suits up to the stores like the Bonwit Teller department store to sell their first order. It is a place inextricably linked to our city's history, but also our present, and I very much believe our future, which is what brings us to this hearing today. For a variety of reasons, like financial realities around garment production in Midtown that have changed, and now we have a much smaller collection of garment manufacturers than we had 30 years ago when the zoning we're discussing today was initially put in place. My goal over the course of the next several weeks is to build on the work to date to make sure we have a stable foundation as possible for garment manufacturing if we are to lift the zoning. Based on much of the feedback from the community boards who are here today, I want to thank community boards uh, four and five. I see uh, Wally, the district manager of CB5 here, and I see Joe Restucia, my friend uh, from community board four in the back as well, and Jesse Bodine, the district manager of CB4. I want to thank uh, the community boards, of course, our borough president, Gail Brewer, and the other garment stakeholders. Uh, we have, I believe, five goals in mind over the course of the next few weeks as we are in this stage of ULERP, as we prepare to make a final decision here at the Council. The first goal, number one, is preserve as much additional square footage 
for manufacturing space in the garment district as possible. And I know that EDC has been working very, very hard on this in securing as much square footage as possible. Number two, ensure long-term and stable uh, and a stable funding stream for garment support. And there have been conversations with the city and the bid on uh, maintaining that revenue stream in the future, uh, that funding stream in the future. Number three, explore opportunities for preserving the architectural legacy of the district, which we believe there is an architectural legacy uh, to the garment district, and we wanna preserve that as much as possible. Number four, we wanna make investments to improve the sidewalks and public spaces in and around the garment district, where, of course, because of its location, it is heavily trafficked and congested, and we wanna make sure that the public upgrades that are needed are um, gotten during this process. And lastly, number five, address a variety of zoning inconsistencies that we believe have been raised by the community throughout this process. Again, I really wanna thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we have, have a very, very busy day here at the council with a multitude of hearings across the street and here in City Hall. Uh, and I'm gonna be going to some of these hearings, so I'll be in and out, but our land use staff will be listening uh, closely. I wanna apologize to the committee council for having to uh, wear a jacket uh, during today's hearing because of the temperature in City Hall. And I look forward to continuing to work together to make sure we push as hard as we can to achieve the right outcomes for the people who work here and for the broader needs of the fashion industry. Uh, you know, this has been a vexing problem for uh, decades now, and I believe that the status quo zoning uh, is not an answer for the future. I do not believe it's uh, how to actually even actually preserve the existing garment manufacturing that we have. And so this has been uh, a sometimes painful conversation uh, because it's complicated and uh, because there are many different factors at play. I really, again, want to commend uh, the borough president, who I think took a leadership role about a year and a half ago in saying we need to pause here, look more deeply into this, bring together a steering committee of stakeholders with EDC and the Department of City Planning at the table and have a more granular, in-depth conversation about what we can do to preserve the existing space. And I, you know, at the time, I think there were folks that were concerned about taking that pause and wondering if it was really a, a temporary pause or it was gonna be something that ended up uh, killing us being able to have a conversation about changing what I think is outdated zoning that exists right now. And I believe it was actually very, very positive for all of us to be able to collaboratively work together. Uh, again, I wanna thank uh, uh, James Patchett, who has shown, I think, enormous leadership uh, throughout this process, and his staff, and of course, Edith, who I've worked with for many years at the Department of City Planning, and Cecilia, who has worked on this uh, before James was president of EDC. She had been on this project, and I was having conversations with her about this, I think, is my in my second year as a council member. It's been a long road to get here. We are still not done. There are still outstanding questions that I raised in my opening remarks, but I believe that uh, in the good faith negotiations and hard work that we've all put together on this, uh, if we continue that work over the next month, we're gonna be able to hopefully get something that is good for the existing manufacturers in the garment districts, supporting them and securing uh, their place in the future and having a conversation about other necessary uses like class B office space uh, for uh, tenants that need it in that part of town. So again, Chair Moya, I wanna thank you for having this hearing. I know it has been a long day uh, at this committee so far, and I look forward to hearing uh, the testimony, and I'm gonna have some questions as well. I also wanna thank uh, my colleague, Keith Powers, whose district is adjacent and shares uh, part of the uh, zoning that we're talking about today, and so I'm glad that he is here to be part of that conversation. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for um, uh, your words and uh, working so diligently on this uh, project. Uh, so now we'd like to open it up to testimony. <clears throat> thank you. Good morning, City Council Speaker Johnson, Chair Moya, and members of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee, which in this case is Keith Powers. Uh, <laughs> my name is... <laughs> My name is James Patchett, and I am the president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. 
At EDC, it's our goal to make the city the global model for inclusive innovation and economic growth, fueled by the diversity of our people and businesses. We're dedicated to bolstering the city's economy, strengthening our neighborhoods, and increasing economic opportunity for New Yorkers. The Garment Center holds a remarkable place in our history and remains a crucial part of our economy. It has been the home of fashion for more than a century, as the speaker said, and has allowed New York to claim the title as fashion capital of the world. It also has offered a critical point of entry to work for generations of immigrants from around the world. Still today, fashion manufacturing plays an important role in ensuring the sector continues to thrive in New York. However, there has been a steep decline in fashion manufacturing since 1950. It is important to note that these changes are not unique to New York City, and declining trends are similar to those in the rest of New York State and around the country. Today, people want to spend less on fashion and change clothing more regularly. These systemic trends in the fashion industry, which have coincided with changes in foreign policy and the expansion of globalization, have profoundly impacted the sector around the globe and in New York in particular. That is why EDC and the city are making historic investments in this sector through a variety of initiatives, including ones that support the industry in the Garment Center and beyond. Today I will discuss the current state of the fashion industry and garment manufacturing in New York, recent economic trends in the Garment Center, and how the city is supporting the industry, background on the history of garment manufacturing, and finally the historic package of investments and programs the city unveiled this past June that will support the fashion manufacturing industry. Before I go into more detail, I really want to recognize the leadership of the speaker, who has been an enormous partner in this process. We would not be where we are today without you, and we wouldn't have the fantastic package that we've collectively worked on together and certainly needs additional work. Um, I also want to thank your staff, Jason, Eric, and Raju for being really great partners in this. It's been a team effort, and I agree with you that Bre Borough President Brewer has been a real leader on this, bringing together the members of the steering committee who I'd also like to thank. Um, they've all had important ideas, I think many of which are reflected in the comprehensive set of, uh, the comprehensive package that we're discussing today. It's this leadership that has greatly influenced our support for the city and made our proposal stronger. <clears throat> Fashion is an iconic part of our DNA and a critical, comp critical component of our economy. Fashion Week alone generates tens of millions of dollars in revenue and continues to make New York the fashion capital of the world. Local garment manufacturing is a critical piece of the New York City fashion ecosystem. It makes us competitive by ensuring we can turn around quality items quickly and conveniently. It also supports the entire industry's design and innovation through prototyping and sample making. It provides emerging designers the ability to produce their collections locally in small samples and to make their name in the competitive industry. It also allows more established designers to make products in real time for Fashion Week and other shows, in addition to differentiating their brand by producing locally. Since 2014, the city has heavily invested in education, real estate, and programmatic initiatives to support the industry. Early in the administration, we committed $74 million to build FIT's new building on the, its, first, uh, its first new building on the campus in decades. Through a variety of initiatives, the administration also tripled direct industry investment from $5 million to $15 million. Through partnerships, our goal is to create and retain quality jobs, as well as catalyze innovation and support business and entrepreneurial growth. Under the umbrella of the Made in New York brand and promotional campaign, EDC has launched a range of initiatives to support the entire value chain of the fashion industry. Some, in, some of the highlights include the Future Fashion Graduate Showcase, Micro Manufacturing and Retail acti Activations, the Fashion Manufacturing Initiatives, one of the largest initiatives which was developed by our, one of our key partners, the Council of Fashion Designers of America, and over, over the past five years, FMI has distributed $2.8 million to 25 factories and is looking to expand its support and investment of fashion manufacturers through the next phase of this program. During its heyday in 1950, 90% of women fashion garments sold in the U.S. were made in the Garment Center, 90%. But the vast majority of New Yorkers today are wearing clothes that were manufactured overseas. In 1987, more than 30,000 garment workers occupied nearly 9 million square feet of production space in the neighborhood. And this was still way after the Garment Center's peak. But today, we are left with only about 4,400 employees who occupy 1.4 million square feet of production space in the district, and about half the number in the preservation areas. This represents an 85% decline in employment and a 92% decline in square footage in just three decades. 
The garment district remains a hub for fashion manufacturing, design, showroom, and wholesale businesses, all of which covet the area for its historical cachet, proximity to industry businesses, and great transit access. However, in New York, we have also watched the garment industry decluster and form multiple hubs across the boroughs. This is to take advantage of real opportunities and labor real estate opportunities and labor proximity. Today, Sunset Park represents the second largest cluster of garment manufacturing firms outside of the garment district with over 100 companies. The administration is committed to helping to stabilize and grow like local garment manufacturing in New York City. One of the most effective and easiest ways for us to achieve that goal is to leverage our assets in existing garment manufacturing clusters. In Sunset Park, we are investing $136 million at Bush Terminal to transform 200,000 square feet into a dedicated garment manufacturing and film hub. At the Made in New York campus, we will maximize our double bottom line and offer tenants affordable rents of $16 to $25 per square foot, long-term leases, and a range of sizes up to, from 2,000 to 20,000 to 20, 20, 20, square feet, accommodating both small and large firms. We have already started demolition at the property and are targeting construction completion in 2020. This investment complements those that we are making at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, where we already lease over 250,000 square feet of space to fashion tenants. Since last summer, FIT has been providing education classes at BAT. We regularly speak to businesses who are interested in moving to these campuses and are excited to continue growing the second largest fashion manufacturing hub in the city. The ability for the city to directly provide real estate affordability and stability in the garment center is much more complex. We do not own real estate in this neighborhood. On top of that, manufacturing properties are scattered and often mixed, mixed in with out office uses in the same building. <clears throat> While the garment center remains the largest cluster of garment manufacturing in the city, with approximately 700,000 square feet of production, representing 250 firms, left in the special zoning district preservation areas. This is also approximately the same amount of square footage located outside of the preservation areas. These firms encompass all subsectors, including pattern making, sampling, jewelry, accessories, and wholesale. <clears throat> Additionally, because of its central location in the heart of Midtown, the district has seen a significant increase in hotel construction. There have been more than 5,000 rooms built since 1999. For context, that is almost two per block in the garment district. As the president of EDC, I would be re remiss not to address the incredible job growth the district has experienced over the past decade, decade in sectors outside of manufacturing. As the, as the speaker noted, the district has seen an extraordinary influx of new office space and loft buildings, which has led to the creation of thousands of new jobs. This represents a 56% increase in jobs from 2000 to 2016. This approximately 12 block area now contains over 66,000 jobs. Over the half of the employment in the district is now in the creative economy. There are many nonprofits, education, healthcare, and tech startups, and architecture engineering firms that are starting to grow. Many of these represent, many of these jobs are small firms, generally less than 15 employees, and occupying less than 3,000 square feet. In a city that has lost more than 6 million square feet of Class B office space since 2000, the garment district stock of historic buildings with smaller floor plates has proven attractive to these firms. To respond to these changing economic trends in the garment center, and in particular the continued decline in garment manufacturing, Speaker Johnson and Borough President Brewer convened and co-chaired the new Garment Center Steering Committee. It identified non-zoning based solutions to help sta stabilize garment manufacturing in this historic home of fashion. The steering committee was comprised of a group of stakeholders representing the industry, community boards, advocacy organizations, and real estate interests. The group met for three months during the summer of 2017 and released a report in August of 2017, which identified a set of recommendations for three topics, real estate, workforce development, and placemaking. Real estate stability proved to be the steering committee's main priority. Real estate stability is critical to any business, but particularly for garment manufacturing, where it helps enable long-term business decisions. Continued programmatic support in workforce development, marketing assistance, and placemaking were also discussed and deemed important to for the future of this industry. As I mentioned earlier, given this lack of city-owned real estate in the garment center, the steering committee coalesced around the need to be creative and study the possibility of using other real estate tools, such as the IDA and acquisition, to incentivize and partner with landlords to allow for longer-term leases in the garment center. One of the first and major initiatives we developed in response was a custom tax incentive program. 
Through the program, property owners are required to offer long-term leases at a minimum of 15, year, 15 years, capped at a maximum of $35 per square foot. <coughs> this price includes all utilities and any fees for property management. First and foremost, the program was conceived to support fashion manufacturing. However, the steering committee pushed us to think beyond fashion manufacturers and look at every type of business along the fashion production supply chain. So we expanded the fashion manufacturing definition to include suppliers and costume makers, which are also integ integral to this ecosystem. Our, our, our IDA program will be overseen by a dedicated compliance team in my agency. Annual compliance review under our program includes annual certifications from both the property owners and the tenants. The IDA program was officially launched in June with a target of preserving 500,000 square feet. It is important to note that the program is eligible within the entire Garmin Center bid boundary. Zoning preservations are not a predictor of actual location. As I mentioned, half of garment manufacturing occurs outside of the preservation areas. As mentioned, the program currently requires participating property owners give their tenants long-term leases. And under guidance from the speaker and the borough presidents, we are looking to extend options to encourage terms beyond 15 years. Starting at 25,000 square feet of fashion manufacturing, property owners will receive a tax abatement uh, for setting aside gross square footage in their building. We are actively working with multiple owners to secure 300,000 square feet of garment manufacturing space. In September, the IDA board also authorized three properties totaling 200,000 square feet of fashion manufacturing space. And I believe a few owners enrolled in the ITA, IDA program are with us today. For fashion manufacturing businesses in these buildings, this means considerable real estate security and longevity. We are also in active conversations with property owners to enroll more space into the program and are fully committed to continuing aggressively marketing this program. Our goal is to sign up as many buildings as possible and provide long-term stability in the district. <clears throat> Another long-term goal of the steering committee was to secure a building in the Garment Center. This was the priority the speaker made clear. We have made good on our promise to help achieve this goal by releasing an RFEI last month. This will provide up to $20 million in city capital to acquire a building and secure a not-for-profit partner. We are confident that the city's historic commitment of $20 million in funding will enable the acquisition of a sizable, sizable building for dedicated garment space. For the RFEI, we purposefully created a procurement process that would allow as much flexibility as possible considering the variability of the real estate market and the need for a strong partnership. At the suggestion of the steering committee, we expanded the eligible geographic boundary for the RFEI beyond the Garment Center Special Zoning District and bid boundary. The boundaries are now all the way south to West 26th, as far west as 11th Avenue and east to 5th Avenue. The public benefits are t for tenants are clear and will match the IDA program. At minimum, these will be 15-year leases capped at $35. Finally, I would like to touch on programmatic support, the last element of the committee's recommendations. <clears throat> the city, the CFDA, and the Garment District Alliance, which is the bid representing the area, have agreed to fund and deploy a set of programs to support garment, garment manufacturers and designers. This builds upon many years of collaboration between the city and the CFDA. To date, these grants have supported more than 30 businesses. We are currently working with CFDA on a new scope of work that would total $14 million of direct investments. We are very proud and excited about this collaboration. Priority areas have been established as continued technology modernization and workforce development to support competition and innovation and to train the next generation of skilled workers. Additionally, the bid was approved by the City Council just yesterday for up to $2.5 million per year over 10 years, which is a unique commitment from this district to support this critical industry. This suite of programs, in addition to custom real estate programs, represents an unprecedented and comprehensive approach to providing stability for and growing the garment industry in the garment center. We are proud to be a part of this new chapter for this industry in the district. Thank you for your time. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Edith Su Chen, the direct Manhattan Borough Director of City Planning. Thank you, James. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson and Chair Moya. Uh, my name is Edith Su Chen. Uh, I am the director of the Manhattan office at the Department of City Edith, if you could put the mic oh, a little closer. Thank you. <laughs> I think I know that by now. Okay. Um, I, let me repeat a little bit. Uh, my name is Edith Su Chen. I'm the director of the Manhattan office at the Department of City Planning. I am joined here by my colleague, Dylan Sandler. 
I'm here to present DCP and EDC's proposal for a zoning text amendment to the Special Garment Center District. Our proposal updates the zoning regulations of the Special District by removing the requirement to preserve manufacturing space. We believe the preservation requirement is not reflective of the land use in the area, which includes the evolved needs of the fashion industry. Um, the, the Garment Center Special Zoning District was established in 1987 with the goal of preserving apparel manufacturing and fashion related businesses. Within the district, preservation areas were created on the side street blocks. Within these areas, uses were restricted to industrial, retail, or wholesale showrooms. Converting to office use within these preservation areas was permitted only with a CPC chair certification and a restrictive declaration confirming that an equal amount of space for manufacturing use was preserved in perpetuity. Along the avenues, the underlying M16 zoning applies, which permits commercial office as of right. Uh, you may recall also the district was amended in 2005 in conjunction with the Hudson Yards rezoning to allow for a broader mix of residential and commercial development west of 8th Avenue. Next slide, thank you. Despite these zoning efforts to bolster the industry in the garment center, apparel manufacturing continued to decline significantly over the next few decades. This is a consistent trend nationally and in New York City. And as James noted, uh, the decline was precipitous. Um, in 30 years, uh, manufacturing decreased uh, 85%. As the fashion industry has evolved, um, a portion of space that was previously occupied by manufacturing has converted to showroom and allowed use which has been on the rise over the past few decades. Similarly, there has been an increased demand for office space for fashion-related companies within the garment center. That has led to some illegal conversions of some previously industrial space. Next, please. Even though garment production has declined, it remains an important part of the fashion ecosystem in Midtown Manhattan. The apparel manufacturing companies that remain tend to be small, though, with an average size of 5,000 square feet and about 10 employees per company. Approximately half the space devoted to garment manufacturing that remains in the garment center is located within the preservation areas and <coughs> half is located outside where there is no preservation requirement. The real estate programs being implemented by EDC are designed to provide affordable space for these types of apparel manufacturing businesses. The garment center has also seen a growth in office space sectors including fashion companies, nonprofits, architecture, software companies and others. The proposed text amendment is intended to ensure that zoning is reflective of the mix of uses in the garment center, which includes thousands of office-based tenants. Next. So to our zoning proposal. The proposed text amendment would reinstate the underlying M16 zoning district in the preservation area between Broadway and 8th Avenue, creating what we now call A1. This would eliminate the manufacturing preservation requirements and allow many existing property owners that are currently non-conforming office uses to receive the proper certificate of occupancy and to cure outstanding use violations. We are also proposing modifications to create bulk envelopes that better match the existing buildings and neighborhood character. Next. The preservation area between 8th and 9th Avenues would now be called A2 and the underlying C64M Hudson Yards regulations would continue to apply. However, in the A2 area, existing regulations that restrict office and residential conversions of buildings greater than 70,000 square feet would be modified so that these larger buildings could be converted to office use. Residential conversion in these existing large buildings would continue to be disallowed. Um, and then across the entire district, we are proposing sign regulations that are consistent with C64 districts, which is more restrictive than the underlying M16. This would reduce the allowable height and size of signs. Within A2, where there are more residences, we propose that flashing signs be restricted. Finally, the proposed text amendment would also create a zoning special permit for hotel use within the district, and this would be consistent with the proposed M1 hotel special permit. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now want to turn it over to uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you for your testimony today. I have a few questions uh, that I think we can get through pretty quickly. Uh, as you know and as you acknowledged, uh, James, uh, the borough president and I and the uh, almost in the entirety of the steering committee 
pushed very hard at the beginning of this process for the city to do everything in our power to acquire a permanent home for garment manufacturing. You mentioned the RFEI went out. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about the process, the timeline, and any reassurance you can provide us that we're making progress on finding a permanent home and dedicated building for garment manufacturing within the district that you outlined in your testimony? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> so the, the RFEI went out last month um, as a result of you know, your and the borough president's advocacy for this. Uh, we committed $20 million as a part of this. Um, so we've looked at the financials of this. The average building um, in the garment district area is between 75,000 and 100,000 square feet. Prices for per square foot range from 500 to $700 per square foot. What that means is that a price for a building could be anywhere from 40 million to 70 million dollars. $20 million as a portion of that from the city is an enormous down payment on that because it would be married with some investment from the purchasers as well as debt financing. We're very confident that the finances of this pan out. And at the same time, I'll tell you, um, you know, as we have discussed, you know, it's, it is not uncommon for people to put proposals in that, are, um, that, that have funding gaps and we, we regularly work with them to resolve those between ourselves and the, uh, and the parties who are bringing in the proposals. We have a lot of members of the steering committee who have expressed, or members of the steering committee who have expressed an interest in partnering with us on this. You know, we're only a little more than a month into the RFEI, so we would not have expected any responses yet. But we're keeping this open for an extended period of time and we're committed to getting a resolution and are confident that we can. How long uh, will the RFEI process be open for? So the, the RFEI is open for uh, one year, and we started accepting submissions uh, beginning at the beginning of this month. We did not expect anyone to be able to put together a proposal within 30 days, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we're in conversations with some folks, and we're hoping to see a proposal um, early next year. So you are committed yes. to, over the next year, working with potential respondents, and being creative and thoughtful and strategic with them to find a building to ensure that any issues that come up around financing uh, on a potential building, you're gonna work with them because you all support finding this building. We support this. I think it was a, it was a critical concept to preserving the industry overall. We support it. We will work with them to resolve this. We know it's a critical priority of yours and we're committed to working with respondents to getting uh, a result that it is a permanent home for the garment district in this neighborhood. Yeah, you also uh, mentioned in your testimony the progress that's been made on the IDA front mm -hmm. in securing currently 200,000 square feet of manufacturing space yes. that we preserved through the IDA program. There was uh, an aspirational goal through the steering committee to try to get up to 500,000 mm -hmm. square feet, though I think people acknowledge that that was gonna potentially be difficult to get to that number, mm -hmm. but I think there was uh, a level of expectation and hope that we'd get to 300,000, 400,000 square feet. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, in a more specific detail, uh, about some of the challenges mm -hmm. that has presented itself on getting additional square footage through IDA and what you all are doing uh, over the next month in ULERP mm -hmm. to continue to try to get folks to participate in the IDA program to preserve additional existing manufacturing space. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the challenge is, frankly, that there are many, many different property owners um, in this neighborhood, some of, of varying levels of sophistication and comfort with working with the city. We, are, we know every property owner, have identified every single property owner that, is, uh, that, that has manufacturing space in this neighborhood, and we have reached out to all of them. We've knocked on their doors, we have met with any and all of them that will take our meetings, uh, we have done this repeatedly, and that's what's resulted in the transactions that we have before us, and what's resulted in the additional, uh, the, 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 the 200,000 square foot that we have approved through the IDA, and the remaining um, conversations that we're having. We are in active conversations with a series of property owners. We are gonna continue to aggressively pursue those. Ultimately, it is up to the property owner to be comfortable with the structure. And we are 
doing everything within our power to encourage them to come to the table, to reach a resolution, and we are committed to getting as close to 500,000 square feet as was in, in the city's power. Uh, thank you. I just, you know, 200,000 is not the number that I want to end up at. I want to end up at a higher number, uh, closer to somewhere between 400 and 500,000 square feet. I know, and so I'm not saying this in a critical way of you all, because I know how hard you've worked in engaging property owners to get people to understand the benefits of the IDA program and to uh, sign up for the preservation and the benefits that are transferred to them if they do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to, to sort of redouble our efforts over the next uh, three or four weeks yes. to, conti to continue to, to press uh, folks to understand those benefits. And, and if there's anything that, that I can do or that other stakeholders, the community boards, the borough presidents, uh, other folks can do. We really want that number to be increased. I understand. We will do everything within our power. We're laser focused on this. I have a list of <laughs> of everyone, um, and we're going to work together. And uh, we'll t appreciate your offer of assistance, and we'll certainly be taking you up on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, w I have a question for ED for uh, DCP uh, City Planning. I've heard from uh, the local community and to the great community boards who are represented here, and who I have the uh, pleasure of working with every day, Wally and Jesse and Joe and other folks that may be here, uh, that uh, there are some significant details relating to the location of residential space and commercial space. I don't want to get into all the details here, but successfully resolving some of the issues that have been brought by uh, these community boards uh, is very, very important to me. And I've mentioned this to the president of EDC, to James, that these are not, in, in my estimation, hugely complicated or significant issues that shouldn't be able to be resolved with some uh, thoughtful collaboration between the community boards, the Department of City Planning, and the Department of Buildings. I think these are things that should be able to be resolved pretty quickly. So I, I wanted to. Uh, see if you've heard of some of these concerns and what's being done to address these concerns over the next few weeks in ULERP. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Yes, we've heard of these concerns and we are happy to continue to work with the community and with property owners uh, to come up with a solution for um, the, the issues that you uh, speak of. So we'll be in, in close touch with the community boards in particular. So we need to get this done. This is important to me. It's important to the community boards. It's related to residential and commercial space for projects that I don't think are crazy or they're asking for anything special. It's kind of minor stuff that because of the outdated zoning that exists in this area has been difficult for the community boards to get through projects that have community support. Um, so it's really important to me that we resolve these issues and I hope Edith, you and your team uh, with Danielle can sit down uh, over the next couple of weeks with the community boards and with the Department of Buildings to figure these issues out. Yes, we'll do. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and then under the zoning that is in place today, some property owners have uh, converted their manufacturing space to commercial space and they've enjoyed the benefits of legal conversion. Can you tell us how much space in the preservation areas have been legally not illegally, legally converted, and how much space has restric restrictive declarations on it that governs the preservation of manufacturing space? Yes. 180,000 square feet of space was legally converted in the preservation areas, and those properties also do have the res restrictive declarations. 180,000 have been legally converted uh, to uh, uh, from manufacturing to commercial space, and all of that space has restrictive declaration on it. Yes, the the, the conversions required uh, a CPC chair certification as well as a restrictive declaration. So why uh, why would we not keep these restrictions in place? Well, frankly, we believe that the underlying zoning that led to th that that created the preservation requirements are no longer appropriate. And, and Speaker Johnson, I appreciate your blunt language when you talked about the ineffectiveness and the outdated um, uh, zoning at, at, in your introductory remarks. Um, 
we don't think it's good policy to continue to hold the property owners to the requirements that we think are inappropriate. And um, this policy is consistent with precedent uh, when we eliminated the preservation requirements in Chelsea around 23rd Street um, a number of years ago. So one of the issues that we ran into in this entire conversation and that the uh, really think showed the uh, inadequacy and ineffectiveness of the existing zoning was that there were millions of square feet that was um, out of compliance uh, on preservation uh, that was happening every single day, every single year, and that number kept growing. Has DCP checked to see whether building owners who did the legal conversion, that they are complying with the restrictions that they've recorded against their properties? Um, I'm, I'm Dylan Sandler, Department of City Planning. So, so of the, there are 180,000 square feet of space that have restrictive declarations preserving them as manufacturing. Um, those were mostly preserved in the early to mid 90s um, and, and for a time did have manufacturing space, but a, big, a large portion of those actually have converted to, illegally converted to office. Uh, we think it's about uh, 60,000 is currently manufacturing and 120,000 is currently office. Um, we, we did look at the, the certificates of occupancy of those spaces um, and, and they do note the restrictive declarations and many of them have uh, been issued violations and penalties for illegally converting, um, but, but the property owners chose to, to go ahead and, and Ill illegally convert. Um, and, and I guess one, one other thing to add is that the, the enforcement is complaint based and so, so presumably some, some properties did convert and uh, if, if there were no complaints, uh, there, there, was no, there was no recourse that, that immediately happened from that conversion. I think, that, I think this speaks to why <clears throat> the IDA program that the steering, you and the steering committee and the borough president have advocated for makes so much sense. The IDA program is an incentive-based system <coughs> with specific financial penalties and is a proactive re reporting requirement from not just the landlords but also the tenants. We have to receive every year a, a certification from the tenants that their landlord is complying with the terms of the IDA agreement. Uh, so that is a significant, uh, significantly greater bar and a much higher level of certainty that we'll know specifically what's happening and know the moment that anyone steps out of line with the regime that's set in place. So I just wanna go back, that's very helpful and I agree with you, uh, James. So I just wanna go back, Dylan. So it's, it's complaint driven, but the building owners who have done these conversions with the restrictions, with the restrictive decks that have been recorded against their properties, are we proactively going and checking on that square footage and making sure that they are complying with the restrictive declarations? No, that, that, that is not a part of the, the process. So because the restrictions came about um, through, through a, a, a zoning application, uh, it's, it's technically a, a it, it's a zoning violation, and so it's on the Department of Buildings uh, in the same way that they, they typically enforce uh, non-complying properties. It's on the Department of Buildings to, to inspect and, and issue violations when, when there is a complaint, but they don't, uh, there isn't a system to proactively go out and, and monitor those spaces like there would be with the, the IDA program. Should there be a system in place that? I don't think I can respond to that. Okay. Um, Well, I'm, I'm grateful that we're having this hearing today. There are a lot of uh, very important uh, stakeholders that are in this room today that were really uh, an incredibly important part of this process over these last many years. So I think, again, we're able to uh, mold the, the proposal we see in front of us today into a much better product. And so uh, I would ask, of course, that uh, city planning and EDC uh, that some of the folks from the agency stay and listen to the folks that are here that may have other concerns that we're gonna try to be responsive to uh, over this last phase of ULERP. And I look forward uh, to working uh, with all of you. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you to hopefully get this done. But again, we wanna uh, help 
secure that uh, permanent home uh, over the next year through the RFEI, and we want to push that number up from 200,000 to somewhere between 400 and 500,000. We want to respond to the community concerns that uh, are not really part of this, but are but are tangled up in some of the zoning around this. And I look forward to resolving all of that with you. I have one final question, which is. Uh, I know it was part of the, the presentation, the deck that was given. Uh, what is the current status of where things stand on uh, Sunset Park and Bush Terminal and how that complements the proposal that's before us today? Yeah, so, so the status of that is that we're currently uh, in uh, demolition of the buildings to try and advance them to construction completion in 2020. The, the, to us, it's a critical component of the overall plan. It's in the aggregate 200,000 square feet, which will accommodate both um, fashion manufacturing tenants as well as uh, film tenants. Uh, to, to, I think it's really important to have a, a sort of complementary solution to this. The, you know, we recognize that even with all of the programs that we have and our collective efforts to strengthen the Garment Center, you know, $35 per square foot will still be too expensive for some businesses which is why having them in city-owned property in a Sunset Park can help to, uh, to help to strengthen the industry overall. In no way do we see this as a replacement for the Garment Center. We see this as complementary, ensuring that the industry and the city collectively is stronger. Um, we think that they can function effectively together, preserving both as a part of a citywide strategy. And there was already a significant migration of manufacturers from the Garment District to uh, Brooklyn and the neighborhoods that we're talking about. There was a migration to some neighborhoods in Queens. We've seen yep. some of the light manufacturing areas, which has been important to Councilmember Reynoso in his district mm -hmm. and preserving some of that manufacturing. So some of this migration was happening on its own even before we had fully contemplated and gotten to all the details of the proposal before us today. Absolutely. Um, how much has been set aside in the city's budget for uh, the Bush Terminal and the money associated with uh, Sunset Park? $136 million. That's a lot of money, $136 million. And how much money do we think is uh, it going to cost through the IDA program on the issues that we've talked about today as part of the uh, preservation in the Garment Center? Well, so the, the IDA program alone, we don't have a specific estimate because you know, we don't know the extent of it, but it's tens of millions of dollars for the IDA program, just the buildings alone that we're, that we currently are, are that we currently have approved. Um, and so we could expect it to hopefully be significantly higher than that. Uh, we have the $20 million investment in the building the city is prepared to make, the um, $14 million collectively in funding uh, for programs through CFDA, this over $70 million we invested in FIT as a part of this effort to expand, as well as um, the, uh, the, the commitment uh, as a part of the bid efforts to invest another $25 million in the industry. And would you categorize those programs as uh, incentive programs, um, uh, subsidy programs, how would you categorize the programs that we're talking about today? It's a, it's a variety of things. It's, you know, the, there's the investment, just so setting aside the investment in the building, which is an investment in real property, um, as relates to the other, the other efforts, um, you know, we, we see them as a combination of incentives to encourage people to preserve businesses, as well as investments in businesses to strengthen them. So it's to improve the, you know, it, to give technical assistance to businesses, uh, to help them invest in uh, modern manufacturing equipment so they can be more successful over time, to help them market and advertise, investments in workforce development, all of those are a critical part of the plan. And the vast majority of the businesses that are taking advantage of these programs are small manufacturers? Absolutely, in the garment district. Within the average of how many employees? Yeah, I think, I think that, hi, Cecilia Kushner, there is a range, but um, there are a lot of small factories in the Garment Center where you have 15, 20 employees. 
Um, so a lot of the businesses that have been helped through the FMI um, uh, grant program, for example, the last 30 businesses that were helped with two and a half million dollar through the CFDA were uh, are generally small firms. So for them to be able to receive half a million to a million dollar of new equipment, which is an equipment they would never be able to purchase themselves, is a really tremendous direct benefit to their firm and it really translates into being able to produce more garments and being able sometimes to hire someone that otherwise they wouldn't be hired. So kind of direct programming and direct um, funding given to manufacturers is really a really important complement to the real estate stability for IDA. Well, I'm really glad this is going through ULERP. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. I think it's the public review is very important. Mm -hmm. That is good. It's important that we have public review of land use projects that involve a significant amount of money and investment and subsidy, which I think has been a good process. And I think we've gotten to a good place through the process, which I think is completely counter to what we're reading about in the news. And this is not a personal attack on you, James. You and I have a great relationship and I have deep respect for you. Uh, but. It, 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 this process has showed what you can do when you engage stakeholders, elected officials, when public dollars are involved, compared to a cloaked, secretive, in the dark process that cuts out the public charter mandated review of the city council. And again, these are not exactly the same uh, things, <coughs> nothing is, but uh, we're talking about uh, taxpayer dollars, we're talking about a significant geographic area, we're talking about a complicated uh, issue that involves multiple neighborhoods and stakeholders, we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about all of these things, which is what we should be talking about in Long Island City. It's what the council should be talking about in Long Island City. It's what public review is for. It was not your decision to uh, go through the general project plan process but I think it is a very stark contrast that today, after multiple years of conversation, we're able to get to a place that is gonna be benefit small businesses, not multi-billion dollar or trillion dollar valuated companies for the good of the city, for the job market of the city, for the ecosystem of the city, and we're gonna get a lot of benefits out of it compared to, I think, a deal that uh, I understand, of course, we disagree on this, uh, but I, you know, there's a pretty broad disagreement on um, you know, what the potential benefits are. So today's not about Amazon, but I think it's important to uh, give the comparison between when land is involved and dollars are involved, the importance of a transparent process. I think that is sorely lacking in what we're seeing in Long Island City, but I'm grateful we've had that here today. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for uh, the panel for uh, your testimony uh, today. Uh, before we go to the next panel, uh, I just want to open up the vote. Uh, we are joined by Council Member uh, Rory Lansman. Council. Vote to approve 260, 261, 262, and 263. Lansman. The land use items are approved by a vote of eight in the affirmative, no negative, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, the next panel, I'd like to bring up James Lloyd uh, from the Manhattan Borough President's Office, uh, as well as uh, Jeannie uh, Lour Lourdes, Lourdes um, Michelle Feinberg, and Dan uh, Del. Dominion. Yeah. Sorry. Jeannie, is that we have Jeannie? Michelle? And Dan. Right. Uh, so we are going to start with uh, James Lloyd. James, you can take uh, your time because you're here on behalf of the borough president. I just want to remind everyone that uh, we have a two minute um, uh, time frame uh, for your testimony. 
Good afternoon, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is James Lloyd, Deputy Director of Land Use for Manhattan Borough President Gail A. Brewer, and I'm here to make a statement on her behalf in support of our plan for preserving a significant core of garment manufacturing in the Borough of Manhattan. The application for a zoning text amendment to the Special Garment Center District before you today is a component of our plan. However, the success of the Garment Center depends on the success of all the components, including the purchase of a building for permanent manufacturing use, an IDA tax abatement program, and significant financial commitments from the Garment District Alliance and the Council of Fashion Designers of America. I, th I call the plan our plan because the Garment Center Steering Committee, formed by Speaker Johnson and the Borough President, has played an instrumental part in the proposal before you today. I would like to thank all the elected officials, community boards four and five, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, and representatives of manufacturers, designers, unions, and real estate for their continued efforts. Their recommendations have provided valuable guidance for addressing the needs of the garment industry. Through their collective efforts, we have come a long way from the original proposal to lift the zoning restrictions and not provide any accompanying assistance for the garment industry and specifically manufacturers located in Manhattan's historic garment center. The EDC programs that accompany the rezoning are a result of the steering committee recommendations which prioritize the preservation of manufacturing space in the garment center through a tax incentive program and a building purchase. I would not be supporting this application to lift the current preservation requirements if there were no assurances that manufacturing space would be maintained through these methods. These EDC programs, which incentivize the provision of affordable manufacturing space, are available only within the general garment center area. An industrial development agency incentive will provide property tax abatements for landlords who sign 15-year leases with manufacturing tenants. A second program designed to assist in the acquisition of a garment manufacturing building will benefit from $20 million in city funding. Both initiatives will provide garment production space at an affordable rate of $35 or less per square foot. Together, the building acquisition and IDA program will provide stability to the garment companies that have recently had to deal with escalating rents and evictions resulting from so many landlords illegally converting their buildings into offices. Without these two commitments, the future of the garment center would be greatly at risk. My office has been hearing from firms that are having difficulty renewing their leases and are facing rising rents. Additionally, financial commitments from the Garment District Alliance and the Council of Fashion Designers of America will provide value support to the manufacturers themselves. Such commitments involve incentives to produce in the city, as well as programming to foster the fashion industry in the Garment Center. In my official recommendation dated August 20th, 2018, I noted that the following three conditions must be accomplished prior to approval of the Zoning Text Amendment. One, EDC must demonstrate that it has or expects to receive one or more credible responses to the RFEI and feasible sites must have identified or EDC must be making any necessary changes to the RFEI to accomplish those goals. Two, the city must also commit to a reasonable amount of additional funding beyond $20 million should that amount prove inadequate. Three, the IDA must have approved or have pending before it applications for the 300,000 square feet of space for which EDC currently, or then, had in sign levers of intent. Additionally, EDC, with the assistance of the Dharma District Alliance, must make every conceivable effort to tame as much additional square footage to the IDA program so that, at a minimum, 500,000 total square feet is preserved. On September 18th, the IDA board approved the participation of three buildings in its program. These buildings total 200,000 square feet. I know that EDC staff are working very hard and they are currently in talks with landlords in the area to get those 300,000 total square feet. We absolutely need to preserve as much manufacturing square footage as possible. And that requires participation not just from the city and the Garment District Alliance, but the real estate industry as well. EDC released its RFEI in October, which is a crucial step towards securing affordable garment manufacturing space. But if it appears that the $20 million committed by the city may not be sufficient, or that other forms of support or flexibility are required to make the building acquisition a reality, we need to be committed to pursuing such support or flexibility. I remember hopeful that the city will make additional resources available as necessary 
to secure the acquisition of a garment manufacturing building. I strongly encourage everyone to work together to ensure that the fashion industry, which brings incredible vitality and economic activity to our city, can stay in the garment center. We very much need participation from the area's landlords in both the IDA program and the RFEI, as we need to secure more affordable garment manufacturing space to bring this plan to fruition. The Council of Fashion Designers of America and EDC are partnering to commit millions of dollars to incentivize local manufacturing, and we look forward to seeing their programs take off. Additionally, as we stated yesterday to the Finance Committee, as it considered an assessment increase to the Garment District Alliance, the bid must make a reasonably long-term commitment to collect and spend $2.5 million each year to improve economic conditions for all businesses in its catchment area, particularly garment manufacturing businesses, provided that there continues to be demand for such assistance. Moreover, we have requested that the bid commit to working with our office and the Speaker's office to ensure that we design programs that will prove effective. The core of the fashion industry has long been Manhattan's garment center, and it must remain that way. In speaking with members of the steering committee and hundreds of garment manufacturers and employees, it became clear that without the central ecosystem of businesses that exist in the garment center, the New York City fashion industry is at risk. After a thorough process that involved extensive engagement and input from stakeholders, we have arrived at a proposal that lifts the old zoning requirements while addressing the needs of the garment industry. We need the EDC programs and the CFDA and big programs to be successful for the sake of New the New York City fashion industry and the city as a whole. I urge that in the remaining month of the land use clock, the landlords and the garment centers step up to participate in the IDA program. All stakeholders work together to ensure the highest likelihood of a successful building acquisition and that the Garment District Alliance commits to working with us on programs to benefit, benefit businesses and especially garment manufacturers over the next 10 years in order to foster the continued health of the garment industry. Again, the borough president would like to thank the staff of EDC, particularly Cecilia Kushner, DCP, the council land use staff, and the speaker staff for their excellent work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important matter. Good morning, Chairman Moya and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dan Dilmanian. I'm representing George Comfort & Sons, a family-owned real estate company now in our 100th year of business. Uh, we are the longtime owners of two properties in the Garment District, 498 7th Avenue and 307 West 38th Street, which is in the preservation area. Until 1994, we also had a 50-year-old leasehold, 50-year leasehold interest in 239 West 39th Street, which is also in the preservation area. We support the zoning text amendment and the proposals to provide direct support to the, government, to the garment manufacturing industry because we believe these actions take a fair approach to all the interests involved. And we believe that the outcome will be good for all of us in the garment district and for New York City. Our company has witnessed the decline of garment manufacturing in first hand, and indeed our business has become impacted by it. Both of our properties within the preservation area were once 100% occupied by garment manufacturers or garment related businesses, but by the late 1980s, production had started moving overseas. Our garment, garment business tenants were struggling to pay just $8 per square foot in rent and there were frequent business failures and, and defaults on leases. Despite our good faith efforts, our occupancy by garment tenants declined every year, and by 2000, we were no, there were no new garment manufacturing businesses coming in. During the 1990s, other types of tenants started gravitating to the garment district, seeking, our more, affordable rents, uh, seeking more affordable rents for a convenient midtown location. These small businesses included construction companies, packaging companies, and early software outfits. More recently, we have seen creative companies, arts, and nonprofit organiza organizations attracted by affordable loft spaces and proximity to excellent transportation options. These alternative uses kept the Garment District from going into a steep decline, yet in much of the neighborhood, they remain prohibited. The restrictions should be lifted because it, it will legitimize these critical tenants and increase our ability to find others. 
and I am also confident that legit legitimizing this mix of uses will lead to improvements in the neighborhood, and that would be good for everyone who lives, works, or does business in Midtown. But equally as important, we think the restrictions should be lifted because they didn't work, and it seems that the programs and supports that EDC is proposing will work. By providing assistance directly to garment manufacturers through tools that address everything from work force development and equipment to rent guarantees, the city is offering the industry a re realistic way to stabilize and modernize within its historic home. I urge you to support both these proposals as they will benefit everyone in the garment district. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Feinberg. I own New York Embroidery Studio. I've been on 36th Street for close to 30 years. Um, I've been in my current space now for close to 16 years. I've won uh, the FMI grant um, several times. It's enabled me to invest in technology and investing in the Garment Center has <coughs> helped help keep my business relevant um, and help it grow. I have new customers. I, I deal with all the shows in both New York and in Paris. Um, the new equipment has helped keep business domestic that would have had to have been done offshore. Um, we have, we're one of the only factories to have a fiber metal laser, so the, the FMI grant has enabled us to bring technology here that otherwise wouldn't have been in New York. Um, the EDC is helping us um, by partnering with my landlord and negotiating a long-term uh, lease for us. We'll be able to retain employees and give our current employees a better life. We're hoping to invest in our infrastructure with better electric power and possibly even some air conditioning, which would make life a lot better for us in the factories. You can and walk outside today if you want air conditioning, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, heat we have, uh, air conditioning we, we would like to have, but um, thank you so much for hearing Thank us. you for your testimony. Hi, I'm Ginny Lelutis, and I'm the executive director of the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York. This is my testimony. Looks like this. I got you. The service and advocacy organization for New York's nonprofit theaters. We have 400 plus members. I want to thank the City Council Committee on Zoning and Franchise for allowing me to testify at this hearing. Um, Art New York was founded in 1972. Over the years, we've earned a reputation as a leader in providing progressive services to our members from shared office, rehearsal, and performance space to the nation's only revolving loan fund for real estate to technical assistance programs for emerging theaters, which have made our organization an expert in the needs of the nonprofit theater communities of New York City. Art New York supports the initiatives set forth by the Mayor's Office of City Planning and the Office of Economic Development to remove the preservation restriction in the Garment District and replace it with programs to directly help garment manufacturers. Like New York City's garment manufacturers, New York City's nonprofit theaters have struggled for years to find affordable office rehearsal and performance space. The off-off-Broadway movement had its origins in the East and West Villages and have traveled to Soho, Hell's Kitchen, the Lower East Side, Tribeca, and now Brooklyn and Queens. Those of us who are fortunate found homes in the garment district in the late 1990s. In 2001, Art New York signed a 20-year lease with Gorel Family Properties to transform 36,000 square feet of space at 528th Avenue into 20 offices for our member companies as well as seven rehearsal studios. The neighborhood was quite different than it is today. Side streets were dark, oh. and some parts of 8th Avenue were safer than others. Despite these small inconveniences, we loved the area, which was not only adjacent to Broadway but blocks away from Penn Station and Port Authority, as well as dozens of subway lines. We clicked quickly attracted 20 companies to rent offices for us, and our rehearsal studios have done a brisk business seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, I know my timing is coming to an end, so I'm just going to repeat that um, we uh, completely understand what the garment manufacturers are going through, and therefore we are supportive of these incentives to lift the restrictions so that you can help ensure the future of the garment manufacturing industry in New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. I don't have any questions, but I am descended from two people who worked in the garment district a long time ago. So, and my brother is an actor, so full disclosure. Perfect. I'm gonna call up the next panel. I wanna thank you all for being here today. Get home safely.
Um, uh, the next panel is Jesse Bodine. I hope I got that right. From Manhattan Community Board, looks like either four or 11. Four, okay. Uh, Joe Restuccia, also from board four. Wally Rubin from board four, uh, board five, I'm sorry. And uh, Alan Friedman from the Pratt Center for Community Development. Jesse, if you'd like to begin, or? I'm Adam. Anybody? You want me I to? defer. <laughs> okay. Please turn on your mic. I don't know if there's a red light on. Thank okay, you. Okay, we're good to go. I'm Adam Friedman. I'm the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. I was also a member of the task force, past president of the Garment Industry Development Corporation, and I worked on the Board of Estimate when this zoning was originally passed. Um, I think the zoning was successful, and that's why you have this incredibly vibrant ecosystem. I'm just going to do my best to summarize the testimony. Though we support this alternative approach to the zoning, uh, the city is putting in place tax incentives, a nonprofit ownership model, and a program to improve the competitiveness of the industry, and that's the approach we've uh, supported for over a decade. However, there are some really critical issues which have not yet been resolved. First of all, we strongly support the city's efforts to subsidize the acquisition of space by a nonprofit that will tenant and curate that space in the industry's in interest. Um, it's not going to be cheap. The city has committed $20 million, but I expect another 40 or $60 million will have to be added to that to, to make it re viable. Um, that seems like an outrageous amount of money for the acquisition of a building, but let's remember what's behind this. It's the protection of an industry, and it's also the creation of a new office district. I mean, that piece of the, the puzzle, that piece of the vision has kind of gotten lost here. The city and the office and the building owners are going to reap a tremendous benefit from what this area evolves into, and they should contribute to the acquisition of this building cost. Second, the city needs to get a firm commitment that the BID will provide funding two million, two and a half million a year for the next 10 years. Third, that funding stream has to be used in the best interest of the industry, and we need to come up with a mechanism, the city needs to come up with a mechanism to ensure that it's spent in the industry's best interest and that there's accountability to the, to the industry. And I don't think that the bid is the right mechanism for that. There's not even a manufacturer on the bid board. Finally, the IDA needs to ensure that the tenants move, as they move out or go out of business, that that protected space is retenanted by another uh, apparel company. Are I don't the, think that's been addressed. Are the manufacturers paying into the bid at this time? Or? I don't think there's a manufacturer on the bid board. Of course they pay in their tenants. So in fact, the bid contribution, a piece of it is actually being paid for by the industry. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. We've come a long way since this proposal was first announced, and we want to thank EDC, DCP, Borough President Brewer, Speaker Johnson for all they have done to make the proposal a better, more holistic one. Our goal at Community Board 5 has always been to preserve the Garment District and its over 5,000 production jobs and tens of thousands of jobs related to and dependent upon those production jobs. These jobs may not pay an average of 150000 a year, as in some other industries we deem worthy of billions of dollars of subsidy, but they are perhaps even more crucial to New York's economy and certainly to the laborers, many of them immigrants, who, deem, who depend upon these jobs to feed and clothe their families. The steering committee that was created to allow all stakeholders a chance to weigh in on this proposed zoning change determined that it was imperative to create a mechanism that would keep a minimum of 500 to 700,000 square feet of garment manufacturing space in the district. Without it, the very fabric of the district, pun intended, would unravel and New York would be in danger of losing the entire industry. 
Maybe this won't happen next year or in five years, but with economic forces in Midtown, what they are, it was clear that in order to keep the industry in New York, government incentives were necessary. The same situation that applies apparently to the tech industry. We were encouraged this past summer when we learned that it looked as if 300,000 square feet would likely be saved through an incentive program that EDC had devised. In addition, thanks to the encouragement of Speaker Johnson, the administration announced its willingness to put aside $20 million toward the acquisition of a building devoted solely to garment industry use. Such a building might preserve an additional 100,000 square feet of space, but more importantly, the space would be permanent. We were getting closer to our minimum of 500,000 square feet and remained hopeful. Unfortunately, this week we learned that one of the building owners backed out of the IDA incentive program. What looked to be 300,000 square feet was reduced by a third to only 200,000 square feet of preserved space. In addition, it appears that in reality, $20 million may not be enough to allow for the acquisition of building. And while a request for expression of interest has been released, there is still a long road to travel before we get anywhere anywhere near the goal of acquiring a building, if we ever do. It is unacceptable to Community Board 5 for this zoning text amendment to pass and for the real estate industry to get what they came to the table for, while the garment industry and the thousands of workers who rely on it are still at such loose ends and utterly unsure of their future. This is far too one-sided a deal. We implore the council to come up with some mechanism to ensure that before the current restrictions are removed, we have in place at least a minimum of 500,000 square feet of garment ma manufacturing space that is needed to preserve this industry. If not, Community Board 5 cannot, in good conscience, conscience support the passage of this text amendment. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Rubin. My name is Joe Rastuccia. I'm the co-chair of the Housing Committee of Manhattan Community Board 5 and a member of its Land Use Committee. I, like Adam Friedman, was in the room in 1984 at City Hall when the Garment Center deal was approved as part of the Times Square rezoning and then two years later when the actual text was approved. Yes, it has not worked because it has not been enforced. It's simply that. As the speaker mentioned, the issue of restrictive deck in the case where manufacturing uh, square footage was preserved, not even those restrictive declarations were enforced. That is something that is done all the time. If someone builds a plaza and decides to close that plaza, there's a restricted declaration and it's enforced and it's kept open, not here in the Garment Center. So I return you first to that issue of the 180,000 square feet. That may be one of our solutions to secure an additional 200,000 square feet to bring this number up. Our board only learned yesterday that the number is now down to 200,000. We echo board five, it is simply not acceptable. If we have to return to the idea of a trigger mechanism that the portion of the zoning that lifts the restrictions is delayed unless and until a certain amount of square footage is put in place, that may end up being some sort of compromise solution and further incentivize also EDC and the administration to actually keep this part of the compromise deal. We really are serious about this and feel very strong about it. The next thing is, the speaker mentioned, we also have not just manufacturing preservation, but in our district in P2, residential preservation. There are approximately 28 buildings containing 500 apartments. They're all scattered small five-story tenements. These buildings, there is a specific provision put in 2005 to prohibit demolition of those residential buildings. The Department of Buildings and Error has issued multiple permits for demolition, and we have tried and engaged with both city planning and the Department of Buildings to make sure not only does it not happen, things get revoked, and there are specific figure, ways to figure out to fix this problem and to create affordable units. We have not been able to resolve this, and just this week we learned again that the Department of Buildings was indicating the best way to fix it is to have a demolition and build a new building. We bring this as a major issue for us on our board, and we thank you for your help on it. Thanks for your testimony. <clears throat> uh, greetings, Council Member, uh, Speaker Johnson, and members of the Zoning Franchise Committee. I am Jesse Bodine, the District Manager of Manhattan Community Board 4. I am testifying on CB4's longstanding advocacy for garment related manufacturing, residential mixed use development, and the preservation of the built environment in the Special Garment Center District. CB4 has supported the protections for manufacturing uses uh, in the district since 1985. CB4 further strengthened portions of the district by insisting that certain text amendments relating to preserving the mix of residential and manufacturing in the district were included in the Hudson Yards rezoning in 2005. Unfortunately, besides putting these protections in place, the city has done little to enforce 
neither the manufacturing nor the residential uh, preservation. In March 2017, the administration presented a plan to lift the manufacturing preservation requirements in the district and incentivize and facilitate the re relocation of the Garment Center to Brooklyn. Neither community boards four, five, nor a number of the important Garment Center stakeholders were included in the creation of that plan. There, there was a strong negative reaction from the community boards, the elected officials, and the Garment Center's business associations, unions, and designers, all of which attended our public meetings on the topic. Thanks to Manhattan Community Board, I'm sorry, thanks to Manhattan Borough President Gail A. Brewer, the plan was paused and the Garment Center Steering Committee was formed to conduct, conduct a true planning process. CB4, along with other stakeholders, attended semi-monthly uh, two-hour meetings over the summer of 2017. The steering committee's rigorous debate resulted in a, a number of recommendations. To the administration's credit, with the help of Borough President Brewer and Speaker Johnson, there have been substantial progress in preserving the exist, existing manufacturing space in the district and the acquisition of new manufacturing buildings in the district. However, CB4 cannot support a plan that lifts the protections of a garment man, of of garment manufacturing uses in the district now based on future promises. CB stands by the recommendations of the steering committee to preserve between 500 and 800,000 uh, square uh, existing manufacturing space and to support the uh, to further support the acquisition of the manufacturing building and the promotion of affordable residential mixed use development. If we all agree that the garment center is a vital and world class ecosystem of garment-related businesses and preserving a core of the garment manufacturing in the garment center is a priority, then we must secure it now before the protections are lifted. Thank you very much for your testimonies. Uh, I appreciate that, and I, I'm sure Speaker Johnson will as well. Our next panel is um, Phil Lavoie of the Gotham Organization, Chris Jaskowitz of the Gotham Organization, Tom Block uh, of 499 7th Avenue, and Steve Boxer of Pachyderm Consulting. Just identify yourself so I know who's here and who's not here. Okay. Okay. So Chris is not here. I'm going to add to this panel Andy Udis. I hope I pronounced your name right. Close enough for government work. <laughs> he is with ABS Partners. Mr. Boxer, if you'd like to begin. Is that microphone, is the red light on? About now, much better. Perfect. Good afternoon, my name is Steve Boxer. I'm the owner of Pachyderm Consulting, an IT consulting firm located in the heart of the Garment District. I support the proposal to lift the use restrictions of the Garment District because I feel we need more office space for companies like mine that are growing in this wonderful neighborhood and have a real need to be located here. I moved to the Garment District in the summer of 2001 because of its central location and excellent transportation network are essential for my business. I and my employees spend our days going back and forth to clients, so having a garment district location makes my business significantly more efficient. In addition, my employees predominantly come from Brooklyn and Queens. The convenience of my location helps me to attract and retain talent in a competitive field. Moving into the garment district was among the best decisions I've ever made for my business. Indeed, several of my clients happen to be in the neighborhood as well. They're interesting non-for-profit uses working hard to make the city a better place. Some of these clients were already mine before I came to the district and others because of my proximity to them. 
In the time since my offices have been located in the garment district, I've doubled my number of employees and I'm on my second office in the garment district. I believe that the amount of space currently being restricted has limited the number of places where my business could locate. Over the past 17 years, I've seen the changes that have taken place and how this area has slowly become more diversified. We're getting more places to eat and there are certainly a lot more people on the streets when I leave, often late at night. All of these changes should be encouraged, especially in the central Midtown neighborhood. And I believe any reasonable steps to promote or accelerate these positive changes should be pursued. I believe that diversifying the business base and increasing options for all businesses will ensure the future of the neighborhood for everyone. And that is why I'm here to support the proposal to lift the use restrictions in the garment district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boxer. Just identify yourself, so. Good afternoon, my name is Phil Lavoie from the Gotham Organization. I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Gotham Organization, which is a family-owned real estate development firm in its 107th year of operation. Gotham developed and owns the Atlas Building in the Garment District, located at 38th Street and 6th Avenue and it contains 373 apartments in addition to 46,000 square feet of office space on three floors and 16,000 square feet of retail space with frontage on both 6th Avenue and 38th Street. The building's home to approximately 600 residents and uh, over 100 people work there, 15 of whom are uh, directly employed by Gotham. Uh, I support the city planning and EDC initiatives because they represent a fair compromise for all parties. The proposal ensures the continued presence of the garment industry in the neighborhood while also allowing the expansion of alternate uses which will create a more dynamic neighborhood for its residents. Many residents of our building have mentioned that they would like to see more uh, <coughs> diverse uses in the neighborhood, especially those which would activate the streets in the evening hours and provide new privately owned public spaces for everyone to enjoy. Other uses are growing organically throughout the surrounding neighborhoods and that should be allowed to happen in the garment district as well. Business conditions have changed since the special garment center district was created over 30 years ago and the neighborhood needs to adapt in an intelligent way. I think the borough president and city council speaker put an excellent plan together with EDC and DCP and it really makes sense for all stakeholders to get this approved. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next. Good afternoon, my name is Andy Yudis. I'm a partner at ABS Partners Real Estate. I'm a leasing and managing agent for over nine buildings in the Garment District and I'm speaking here today on behalf of uh, in support of the City Planning and Economic Development Initiative to remove the preservation restrictions in the garment district and replace it with programs to help directly help garment manufacturers. The families and uh, owners that I represent have owned these buildings for many years and over time we've all seen the decline and deterioration of garment manufacturing firsthand. We simply don't see the demand in our buildings for the types of garment manufacturing that used to exist. Once production started moving overseas, the pressure on local manufacturers became insurmountable. They could no longer afford the rent. The advances in technology have exacerbated the problem. My clients would like the restrictions lifted because they limit the ability to find tenants. Lifting the restrictions will lead to building improvements. They'll be able to reinvest capital in the buildings, and creating a more inviting garment district. What's good for the garment district is good for New York. I also would like the restrictions lifted because they don't work and it seems to me and my clients that the programs and supports that EDC is proposing could by providing assistance directly to garment manufacturers through tools that address everything from workforce development to rent guarantees, the city is offering the industry a way to stabilize and modernize that zoning never could. We urge you to support these proposals because we believe they take a fair approach to all the interests involved and we believe the outcome will be good for all of us and for New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Udis. Mr. Block. My name is Thomas Block. I've lived my 
entire life, 74 years in New York City. It, in the last two decades, I bought two commercial buildings in the garment district. Uh, one is on 7th Avenue, 499 7th Avenue, and the, it's not in the preservation zone. Uh, the other one is on uh, West 40th Street. While it's in the P1 zone, it's not subject to restrictions because it was an office building at the time the special restrictions were started over 30 years ago. For the last decade, I've been on the board of the Garment District Alliance and I'm currently a vice chairman. As all of you know, there are about 700,000 square feet occupied by garment manufacturing within the P1 and P2 zones, and another 700,000 outside within the Garment District Alliance, but not in the P1 and P2 zones. Uh, the amount required under the current uh, P1 and P2 zone restric restrictions uh, devoted to uh, manufacturing is at four and a half million. Uh, the new proposal drafted by the EDC and strongly supported by the Garment District Alliance and improved by Manhattan Borough President, uh, Speaker Johnson uh, and their staffs has many benefits. It helps manufacturers with supportive programs and provides assurances that manufacturers remain in the buildings and that will have uh, space uh, dedicated to manufacturing in the garment district and does not require anyone to leave. Uh, the plan opens up space for new and varied industries which will attract ever more diverse workforce. Those new employees will demand more diverse and vibrant retail. The whole neighborhood will improve. Uh, one may say my comments are self-serving and not altruistic. Actually, it works the other way. Uh, my tenants at the end of the leases will have more choices to move within the district than they do now. And because of lifting the P1 and P2 restrictions, uh, I'll have more competition for new tenants. Nevertheless, I support the program because I'm committed to the neighborhood and I'm dedicated to seeing it continue to evolve into a great place uh, for tenants of all kinds to locate. An improved neighborhood will help us all. Therefore, I strongly uh, support the EDC proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimonies today. I appreciate your being here. Uh, the next panel, uh, Brian Weber, I think it says MCBY, but not sure. Uh, Susan Chin, MCB4, okay. All right. Susan Chin from the Design Trust for Public Space, and Elizabeth Goldstein from Municipal Arts Society. Elizabeth, you're the first person I've chaired two separate committees to hear testimony from, so. <laughs> Just three on this panel. I'd say ladies first, but it's up to you guys. <laughs> Hello. Hi, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm uh, Brian Weber from Manhattan Community Board 4. Oh, okay. uh, my support is, of course, predicated on the conditions laid out by Joe Restuch and Jesse Bodine, and I'm here to address one other facet of uh, preservation. We've talked about preservation of jobs. We've talked about preservation of space. A big concern to the community is uh, preservation of our existing uh, current built environment. Um, early. Uh, Councilman Johnson spoke about the history and legacy of our neighborhood. And as part of that, we recommend that Landmarks Commission um, review and calendar the following specific um, properties to be designated as New York City landmarks. There were seven sites that we identified. Three of them were identified in the ESA done by the DCP uh, in relationship to this rezoning. Those were the Manhattan Center at 311 West 34th Street, the New Yorker Hotel, 481 8th Avenue, and um, 
former Sloan, uh, the Sloan House YMCA at 360 West 34th Street. Uh, we identified four additional sites, and this is all just the tip of the iceberg, but four additional sites that we um, identified were a commercial building, three-story commercial building, 300 West 38th Street, uh, the former uh, New York Edison Company building at um, 308 West 36th Street, the former Barber Dormitory at 330 West 36th Street, and the Webster Apartments at uh, 419 West 34th Street. Several of these sites are what is currently considered overbuilt uh, in zoning, but several of them are also soft sites. These are historical sites for uh, social service reasons, cultural reasons, and infrastructure reasons, and they all merit consideration. It's important to the community that should a rezoning occur that we not lose these historical assets in our built environment. Thank you. That was pretty good timing there. Ms. Chin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is actually Joanna Crisp. I've been asked to I didn't to think read. it was Susan, but I, you know, I've seen her name so many times, I don't know that we've I, ever, I'm there's another testimony. Susan Chin that I do know, but she's <laughs> not here either, so. I'm reading testimony on behalf of Susan okay. Chin. Okay, and your name again? Joanna Crisp. Thank Go you. Ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony for the Garment Center Zoning Text Amendment on behalf of the Design Trust for Public Space. Design Trust does not yet have confidence that the city will fulfill its commitment to implement a plan to keep garment manufacturing in Manhattan and bolster this creative industry and distinctive neighborhood. Since 2009, the Design Trust has worked with fashion designers, garment manufacturers, suppliers, property owners, government officials, and industry leaders to determine the value and interdependence of this core R&D hub and unique business cluster that nurtures fashion startups and innovation. Its seminal studies, Made in Midtown and Making Midtown, made clear that this is the foundation of our city's creative economy and fading manufacturing sector. And if we do not preserve this complex design and prototyping ecosystem, NYC stands to lose our standing as a global fashion capital, a $98 billion business that employs 180,000 people, or 6% of the city's workforce. The city assured the Garment Center Steering Committee and key stakeholders that lifting the zoning restriction in P1 and P2 would be contingent upon its plan to secure at least 500,000 square feet of production space. When the Department of City Planning issued its certification for list lifting the zoning text amendment, the city assured key stakeholders that 300,000 square feet of garment manufacturing space had been secured through IDA. Now we learn there's only 200,000 square feet. The most critical part of the plan is to purchase a building which has not yet advanced. And with the specter of listing the zoning text amendment in this area, will what's now a $700 per square foot property soon sell at $3,000 per square foot. The city and GDA's additional investment of $14 million in the fashion manufacturing in initiative with CFDA is to be lauded, but the time frame is vague and must go hand in hand with IDA for an entire 10 year period to succeed. Um, so just quickly, uh, Susan has outlined a few key recommendations. Delaying approval of the text amendment until the components that will preserve the district are in place. Providing additional city capital funding and seeking state and federal support for a building purchase. Continuing to push the IDA tax incentive program. Ensuring that the FMI program is in place for a 10 year period. And continuing to work with the steering committee to significantly advance the entire plan. Thank you. Your testimony, you said this is a $98 billion business. Is that in New York City? Um, I, I believe that's, that's the, uh, the intent. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Goldstein? Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Goldstein, the president of the Municipal Art Society. In the summer of 2017, the Garment District Steering Committee concluded that the district needed a minimum of 500,000 square feet of affordable space protected for manufacturers for the industry to continue to thrive. Today, we are encouraged by the city's commitment to preserve the uh, district through tax abatement, business development programs, and an initiative to seek a nonprofit partner to purchase and manage a co-op for manufacturing tenants. 
Progress has been made. 200,000 square feet have been secured under the um, IDA tax incentive program, but the critical mass of 500,000 square feet have, has not been achieved. And the final most critical element uh, of the three-pronged strategy, the acquisition of a building to create a permanent, permanently affordable space for businesses in, is encountering some bumps in the road. There is no consensus in the community that the city's investment in such a venture is adequate to make sure that the project actually pencils out. Before you today is the City Council's first step to removing the text amendment that was designed many decades ago to protect garment manufacturing at the core of New York City's garment industry. We are still a very far uh, way away from achieving the minimum square footage recommended by the steering committee. This should give the council pause. It gives MAS pause. You have tools that must be used to ensure that the lifting of the text amendment remains an incentive to achieving the full minimum commitment to manufacturing in the district. You may postpone the date this legislation becomes effective, or you may make this proposal conditional on further progress being made towards the purchase of a building and the enrollment of additional landlords in the tax abatement program, or you might recommend that the greater city capital commitment be ready uh, uh, should it be required. MAS welcomes the progress towards the preservation of production space in the district. However, we call on this committee and the City Council more broadly to ensure that we truly hit the mark that we, are, that we need to ensure a robust future for the Garment District in Manhattan. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for your testimony. Ms. Goldstein, if you could come up here, I just want to ask you a question about another matter. Um, in the meantime, I got it here, I got to ask another question, right? So. Um, uh, Mark Beng uh, Bengualid, I hope I got that right, Kenneth Fischel, Matt Kuder, and Barbara Blair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak, members of the committee. My name is Mark Bengalid. Uh, we're definitely uh, in favor of the uh, support for the proposal before you. And we've heard a lot of testimony uh, to now about what should or should not be done. But I'd like to share a little bit of an anecdote what we see in the uh, garment district. First of all, my father was in the district. You know, he was a shoe manufacturer. He designed, manufactured, and sells shoes. If you remember, Tom McCann, Kinney, Grant, those were the uh, people that my father uh, did the shoe for. Um, in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, you know, Taiwan, China came around, and he was unable to compete, so he closed that portion of the business, which was the manufacturing, and basically had basically a small office. Um, on the flip side of it, my father-in-law, was in uh, the garment district. He was uh, played against Sam, Happy Legs. Those were the production he had there. Again, he had a lot of manufacturing here, but again, when the uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, China came around, he was unable to compete with that, and, and all the manufacturing left the district. And again, he just had a small uh, office and eventually sold the business. You know, in terms of having a real estate, you know, we see constantly. Um, at least in our building, we have people who are in the manufacturing or are designers that come to us um, basically saying that we can't uh, maintain the, the, the amount of square footage, we give them less square footage, they can't maintain that, and basically because the business is changing, they eventually close uh, their uh, business or basically are going elsewhere. So we're definitely you know, in support of the amendment proposed before you. The restrictions of the zoning that was placed there really did not work and did not satisfy what it was intended to do. We think that what is before this committee is actually going to benefit everybody there and as well the garment district. 
and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, you're okay. Uh, let's do it. Uh, my name is Ken Fischel. I'm the owner of 264 West 40th Street, which is a 20-story building uh, between 7th and 8th Avenues. Before I talk about the building, I want to talk about me. Um, my father and grandfather started a sportswear manufacturing company. We made ladies' bathing suits, and we were the largest supplier to Sears and Montgomery Ward and the Spiegel Catalog, among many other uh, catalog companies in the 1960s and 1970s. It was a business that employed over 100 people. We were a union shop. We had um, 40,000 square feet. By the mid-1980s, the business was not a viable business any longer. Um, we faced competition from abroad, and we had to close shop, and we ended up renting out the space. The next phase of my life uh, was when I purchased 264 West 40th Street in 2003. The building had been a scofflaw building. There had been a sidewalk bridge in front of the building for over 10 years. The facade was crumbling. The building was 50% vacant. Nobody wanted the building. It was nothing but a headache with, riddled with violations. But I wanted the building because I had faith in New York and I had faith in the, in the uh, garment district. I went in and I repaired the facade, removed the bridge, upgraded the elevators, and tried to rent out the space, and there were no takers. I tried to comply with the law. So I faced the possibility of losing the building to the bank for non-payment of my mortgage because there was insufficient income to cover it, or renting to tenants that actually wanted the space. Now, those tenants were not manufacturing tenants. I had to then spend additional money, which I really didn't want to do, to upgrade that space from manufacturing level space to uh, otherwise commercial space. And the building rented up, and today the building is fully rented. Um, I'd like to say that I support this proposal for on a number of different levels. I support it not only as a property owner, but I support it as a former manufacturer. Because I could tell you right now, when we were making ladies' bathing suits, if these proposals had been in place, chances are we would have been able to retain that business and keep those jobs in New York City. So I fully support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fischel. Members of this committee, my name is Matt Couder, representing George Comfort and Sons. And I support the proposal before the committee today. George Comfort and Sons is a family owned real estate company now in our 100th year of business. We've owned or had a stake in properties in the Garment District since 1944. Since that time, our company has seen our building tenancy shift from 100% garment related businesses to a diverse mix of office tenants, including nonprofits, arts organizations, tech and media firms. This shift occurred in response to the dramatic decline in garment manufacturing. 40 years ago, at an accelerating rate, garment production began moving out of New York and ultimately out of the country. This left local manufacturers with too little work. Even the garment district's below market rents and protective zoning could not keep our manufacturing tenants from going out of business. As these companies failed, often defaulting on their leases, we saw building vacancies rise. Over time, affordable rents and close proximity to transportation drew other uses to the garment district, preventing this central midtown neighborhood from going into a steep economic decline. We support the zoning text amendment. Legitimizing and encouraging a diverse tenant base in the garment district makes sense for the neighborhood, for midtown Manhattan, and for New York City. This proposal looks to the future of the neighborhood and the concurrent EDC economic development initiatives will ensure that the garment industry retains its place in it. These actions take a fair approach to the interests involved and we urge you to vote in favor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kadir. Ms. Blair. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Barbara Blair. I'm the president of the Garment District Alliance. On behalf of the Alliance, I thank the committee for holding this hearing today, Speaker Johnson, Manhattan Borough President Brewer, EDC, DCP, and industry stakeholders who working with the steering committee has brought us to this moment. The Alliance supports the zoning text amendment being proposed. 
The amendment acknowledges the evolution of the district and addresses the challenges faced by the garment manufacturing sector. From 2000 to 2016, the district lost nearly 13,000 manufacturing jobs. In the same time period, there's been a remarkable growth in other job sectors. 60,000 new jobs in the district, the highest employment number since 1950, generated across a broad section of business sectors. Apparel manufacturing has been declining for 40 years, not only in the garment district, but in the city, state, and nation. The steering committee plan asks that in tandem with the zoning amendment, there be initiatives to mitigate the continued loss of apparel manufacturing in the district. There are four main recommendations we support, and we've been working diligently to advance the IDA program, the purchase of a dedicated building, business development programming to support the manufacturing sector, and public realm improvements. We've taken steps to collaborate with industry organizations and academic institutions to identify programs that will help stabilize and promote manufacturing in the district within the scope of permissible activities for bids and within the bids mission. As a show of commitment, the GDA re requested and received Finance Committee approval for a $2.5 million assessment increase with authorization going forward. This ongoing increase will enable the bid to potentially fund programming, supportive goals, support the goals of the steering committee, and, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought, steering committee, subject to annual bid board approval. We've also initiated plans to consider public realm improvements that celebrate the industry's heritage in the neighborhood, and the neighborhood continues to be identified as a home of American fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I uh, appreciate you being here today and waiting to testify. Thank you. I'm going to dismiss this panel. The next panel is uh, Mr. William Silverman from Otterborg Properties, Samuel Friedfeld of Olmsted Properties, and Jonathan Bowles of the Center for an Urban Future. Well, we're also going to call at this time Eric Garral, uh, also with the GDA. You start now, you'll get an extra few seconds because the sergeant arms isn't ready, but go ahead. Great, I'd, I'd like all the time I, that you give me. Uh, good afternoon. Committee members, uh, thank you for accepting my statement and letting me testify. Uh, I am a member of the firm of Otterberg PC, but I come now as the co-manager of JLJ Bricken LLC the owner of the Brick and Arcade at 225 West 37th Street and 230 West 38th Street, uh, which is right in the heart of the Garment Center. My family has been in the real estate business in the Garment District for four generations. I submit this statement in support of the city planning and economic development corporation efforts to eliminate the preservation of existing restrictive zoning in the garment district and to replace those anachronistic zoning provisions with programs to directly assist garment manufacturers. I was born in New York City in 1942. I'm almost 77 years old and during that time I have observed the decline of garment manufacturing in the city. Another branch of the family was involved in garment manufacturing, and it was really unsustainable in the city because of costs. I remember the time hand trucks, really carts, filled the streets of the garment center loaded with garments and fabric, no more. First in the 1960s, Garment manufacturing went to the southern part of the United States where labor and other costs were lower than in New York City. To remain competitive, garment manufacturing moved again, primarily to Central and South America, and after that to Asia. It is entirely appropriate to lift the zone, 
Is my seatbelt on? No, no worry. I'll let you know yeah. when I've had enough. Thank you. <laughs> it is entirely appropriate to lift the zoning restrictions, not only because they are not in step with business reality, but also because the zoning restrictions limit the ability to attract tenants that want to be in the garment district and have different businesses that are not involved in garment manufacturing. In addition, the zoning restrictions don't work because market conditions no longer support such artificial restrictions. We certainly don't want to go back to sweatshops where the workers are paid a dollar a day, and that would have been competitive now with the markets in Asia. Removing the restrictions will lead to building enhancements and a better, more friendly uh, garment district. Uh, I think that the EDC programs that have been proposed would be highly beneficial to the city and its people by providing assistance to garment manufacturers, as well as programs that provide for workforce development and rent guarantees, among other things. The city and the EDC are offering the garment industry support to stabilize and update the business of garment manufacturing, that zoning or rezoning cannot do effectively. I request that you support these proposals because I believe that the proposals recognize the realities of the 21st century and are fair and reasonable for all parties. The proposals of the city and the EDC will benefit the city, its inhabitants, and really everyone, including the more than 63 million visitors to the city in positive and constructive ways. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Distinguished members of the committee, my name is Samuel Friedfeld and I work with Olmstead Properties. I handle leasing and management for 525 7th Avenue. Olmstead Properties has extremely deep ties to the garment district as we have owned 575 8th Avenue for close to 80 years and 525 7th Avenue for 20 years. We also manage and help lease several other properties in the district. As you can see, I have not been around as long as 575 8th Avenue, but I have been around long enough to see the changes in the neighborhood and understand its true potential. At 525, we made a business decision to stay a fashion showroom building. As time went on, we realized there were less sample and manufacturing tenants and more high fashion and showroom tenants. Some of our tenants include Hugo Boss, Valentino, Nicole Miller, and Columbia. None of them have manufacturing components within our building. Oh, I'm switching my nose is running. Sorry. Sorry to keep sniffling. Thank you. I appreciate it. At the same time, these companies represent everything that is great about the dis district's historic past. I'm here today to support the city planning and economic development initiatives. I believe lifting the district zoning restriction is critical because it prohibits property owners from investing in the neighborhood. All the adjacent neighborhoods, including Bryant Park, Times Square, the soon to be Hudson Yards, and Chelsea have benefited from the decades, decades long uptick in economic activity, but the garment district has been partially and in many cases totally left out of this equation. I believe that all laws are created with good intent in mind, but as time goes on, a law may become less relevant, so much to the point where it begins to hurt the people it set out to help. I believe this is the case with the garment district zoning laws. There is factually no proof that any law has helped keep one manufacturing job in the district or in the state or in the country. What there is proof of, however, is that new and exciting opportunities in the form of tech, advertising, and media, and internet companies are coming to the garment center and they are bringing with them new jobs and the potential for investment. I believe these companies are the future of the garment center. With current zoning restrictions on the books, I believe we will stall all the potential growth of the TAMI companies. The economic plan that the EDC has presented will be the most efficient way to provide support to the garment manufacturers. I urge you to support both these proposals because I believe they represent a fair and balanced solution to the problem at hand. Manufacturers will receive a more meaningful form of assistance 
and the garment district will finally be able to live up to its full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Friedfeld. Hi, my name is Eric Corral, and I'm the CEO of GFP Properties, and I'm one of the owners who are putting in their buildings into the IDA program. Uh, we own five buildings in the district, and I didn't prepare a statement today because I wanted to come and try to respond to some of the things that have already been said. So one thing I think is really important as far as treasuring the history of the garment center is, is basically right in front of you on that TV. If we're going to landmark anything, we should landmark the button and the needle. That's the most iconic piece of, of garment-related history in that area, and that should be the only thing that's landmarked in the area to show how exactly how special it is. These other buildings that these people are talking about have no history going back to the garment-related activities in the area more than that does. So I think that's really important to point out. The other thing, there's, there's generally a mischaracterization of, of sort of how these things work. So people think there's two groups. There's like a landlord group and then there's this sort of fashion group. There's not. There's four groups. There's the landlords who didn't comply and then there's the landlords who did. And then there are the fashion people who, who support the manufacturers and the manufacturers themselves. And then there's all the other fashion people who do not. Those groups are not equal. So the, the advantage of what this program does is this program connects the two people who've done the right thing, which are the landlords that comply and the manufacturers and the fashion people who support them. The only benefit should go to them. That's it. What government should be doing here is not drawing a line between us. You should draw a circle around us. Put us together in this program. Let us work together. We've been doing it for years. But don't let any of the benefits get outside of the area of those two groups. And that's really important. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gorel. Good afternoon, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bowles. I run the Center for an Urban Future. We're a think tank. We publish studies about uh, growing and diversifying New York's economy and expanding economic opportunity. Uh, we've written a lot over the years about the importance of manufacturing to New York City's economy. Uh, in fact, in February of 2000, I authored a study about the apparel manufacturing industry. It was called The Empire Has No Clothes. Rising real estate prices and declining city support threatens the future of New York's apparel industry. So if you had asked me a couple of decades ago uh, how to support the apparel manufacturing industry, I would have said we need to uh, protect the special garment district. Uh, in fact, this report uh, back in 2000, one of our key recommendations was to do just that, enforce current zoning laws in the garment center. I think a different approach is needed today. When I authored the report in 2000, I honestly thought that the garment industry's job losses were hitting a bottom. I was hopeful. But since 2000, since the year we published this report, the apparel manufacturing industry in New York City has lost another 102,000 jobs. This actually represents 99% of all the manufacturing job losses in New York City during that period. And it's also a period when the city overall gained 750,000 jobs. So I think that um, um, the special zone zoning district no longer reflects the, the realities of today's garment district, but it's obviously uh, an important part of our economy. It's long been an entry point to immigrants. It's long been a point where immigrant owners have been able to kind of climb up the ladder. Uh, it's important for the broader fashion industry, which is important, and that's why I support uh, the, the plan that's uh, under consideration now. As a couple other people have uh, mentioned today, I think it's also important that the Garment Center has increasingly become a place where uh, companies from other industries that can't afford Union Square, Flatiron District, Chelsea, architects, graphic design firms, tech startups, they have been moving to the Garment Center, and those are growing industries that we as a city need to support as well. I, I think this plan does that. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Good to see you. Um, I thank you. Get home safely. It's snowing out. Is he here? Okay. We have six more people to testify. Uh, Morty Frutch. He left. Okay. Cassandra Diggs. Michael Brady and Yeho Lee Teng. And either they have very similar handwriting or one person filled out all of these. So. There's two, there's two of you here? Well, if that's the case, I like things cozy. 
Uh, we're also going to call Angela Sung Pinsky or Dinsky. Pinsky? I've never met a Dinsky, so. Uh, I got to get a spokesperson, maybe. And Stephen Epstein from Yahtzee. He left too? All right. Okay, she's speaking for her. Morty is obviously not here. Cassandra, you're here? Yes, I'm here. Michael Brady, last call. Yeholi Tang, did I get, what? I, okay. And Ms. Pinsky is speaking, has also has a spokesperson here. Okay, Ms. Diggs, why don't you begin? Okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Cassandra Diggs. I'm the Chief Financial and Operating Officer of the Council of Fashion Designers of America Foundation. On behalf of Stephen Cole, President and CEO of the CFDA, I'd like to read a statement in support of the New York City Economic Development Corps initiatives outlined for your consideration today. As the governing body of the American fashion industry, the CFDA not only supports its 500 plus CFDA members and emerging brands through its robust programming, but also stands as a front line of support for the fashion manufacturers. Through impactful programs such as the Fashion Manufacturing Initiative in partnership with the New York City Economic Development Corp and industry stakeholders like Andrew Rosen of Theory, the Coach Foundation, and Ralph Lauren, we have made significant strides to support the local NYC fashion manufacturing sector since 2013. FMI includes the grant fund, which has invested 2.8 million to 25 fashion manufacturers, over which 13 have been located in Midtown Manhattan, to invest in advanced technology, as well as manufacturing showcases, collaborations, and workforce development programming. FMI has brought local manufacturing to the forefront of the industry's conversations and helped build crucial relationships between designer and manufacturer, which ultimately leads to more economic growth for the city. The CFDA will expand its programming greatly to not only continue to help manufacturers acquire new technology to remain competitive in the global market, but also aim focus at other ways to increase local production, enhance the city's fashion manufacturing workforce, and market these incredible manufacturers to the fashion industry at large. We believe the future of the industry is a citywide ecosystem, but we remain committed to supporting factories in Midtown. This is why the CFDA fully supports the EDC's ideas put forth, including the IDA program and the building procurement. Mechanisms such as the zoning preservation have been proven to be a lacking system for the fashion manufacturing, and we believe these modern ideas will help preserve fashion manufacturing for the New York's Garment Center. These solutions were researched thoroughly in the direct response to the Garment Center Steering Committee this last summer and are viable options to help move the fashion manufacturing sector forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Diggs. Next. As we covered, my name is Morgan Perlman and I'm speaking on behalf of Angela Pinsky. Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Association for a Better New York, ABNY. We're a 47 year old civic organization that promotes the effective cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. ABNY would like to express our support for the rezoning proposal put forward by the EDC and the Department of City Planning. The fashion industry and garment district have been critical components of New York City's economy for hundreds of years. As New York's dynamic economy continues to evolve, it is important to deeply consider the changes taking place from both a land use and economic development perspective. We believe that the rezoning proposal put forth takes a comprehensive look at the future of the garment district and fashion industry at large. The rezoning of the garment district is a project the city has been deeply considering for decades. We believe that this proposal put forth is a product of those years of contemplation and we appreciate the consideration given to the evolving nature of the fashion industry in New York City, the inclusion of incentives for businesses to remain in the garment district and resources and support for businesses moving to other parts of the city that also represent opportunities for the fashion industry to thrive. 
While we would have encouraged higher densities in a well-transited core of the city, we believe that overall this proposal thoughtfully considers the area's evolving uses and will lead to smart and respectful growth in the garment district. We look forward to productive and inclusive discussion of the proposed development and encourage this subcommittee and the New York City community at large to support the project. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello again. My name is Joanna Crisp, and I am reading this statement on behalf of Yoli Tang, who is a member of the Garment Center Steering Committee and a fashion business owner. As a fashion company designing and producing in NYC, I assure this council that the garment industry is a vital component of New York's fashion economy. This is clearly evidenced by its continued presence in the face of an across-the-board decline in New York's other manufacturing sectors. Our garment companies have relied upon the current zoning text to maintain their presence for the industry. To lift that text without first securing the promised space is a disservice to them, the industry, and the process that created this agreement. I continue to be in favor of this agreement, but strongly ask that the 300,000 square feet be secured first, along with the promised permanent uh, dedicated building. I wholly support the statements made by the Design Trust for Public Space, without whose guidance the zoning text would already be history, and the MAS for determining the effects the proposed changes will have on this industry and the steering committee for their recommendations. The city has made genuine progress in these goals, and I ask, what is the harm in waiting a little longer to ensure the space is in place to secure the industry for another 30 years? Thank you. And last but not least, yeah. I hope not. Good Go afternoon, my name is Payman Lothi, representing the Real Estate Board of New York. Uh, Revenue is here today to support the zoning and economic development proposals for the Garment Center. EDC has developed a two-part program in response to the community's long-standing desire to preserve apparel production in Manhattan's Garment District. EDC's first program is the IDA tax abatement program that will generate 15-year leases at reasonable rents for 300,000 square feet of apparel tenancy in participating buildings. EDC's second initiative is the commitment of $20 million for the purchase of a building in partnership with a nonprofit entity to provide space for apparel production long into the future. Both of these programs were developed in response to the recommendations of the Garment Center Steering Committee and represent the most meaningful commitment the city has ever made to preserve apparel production in its historic home. In addition, the city will also lift the zoning restrictions set in 1987 that impose severe restrictions on permitted and expanded commercial uses. This restrictive zoning ultimately proved to be an inadequate tool in aiding the apparel industry, as has other manufacturing zoning designations throughout the city. However, these restrictions did, not, did nothing to slow the decline of apparel production in the area over the past 30 years including the first five years in which the restrictions had regular enforcement. Zoning is simply an ineffective tool in protecting an industry from the larger and evolving local, national, and global economic forces. The city imposed a unique but well-intentioned burden on mid-block buildings to halt the decline of apparel production jobs. However, 30 years of evidence shows that these restrictions did not achieve its goal. Instead, the city has developed a robust economic proposal at the behest of the community and industrial stakeholders, which will retain a core of the apparel manufacturing industry in the Garment Center for the long term. The Special Garment Center Tax Amendment and the EDC proposed proposal represents our best chance to assist the apparel manufacturing industry, and we urge the council to approve these actions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimonies today. Anybody else wish to testify that hasn't? Okay, uh, seeing none, I am going to close this hearing now on this application and it will be laid over. This concludes today's meeting and I thank the members of the public, my colleagues on the committee, our speaker, the council and the land use staff for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.